Good evening, everyone. I would like to call this Committee of the Whole workshop meeting of April the 5th, 2023 to order. Hello, everyone. My name is Sandra Easton, Mayor and Chair of the Committee of the Whole workshop. All members of Council are in attendance with Councillor Brunet attending remotely. We have senior staff in attendance. Also in attendance, we have Brian Job, Walkerton Clean Water Centre Trainer. Welcome back, Brian. Are there any declarations of interest? There being none, we're now considering item 4.1 on the agenda, which is a presentation regarding the Safe Water Drinking Act. We have Brian Job, Walkerton Clean Water Centre Trainer, joining us and providing a presentation. First, our Director of Public Works will provide introductory comments. And I just want to remind the public that this is um, a program, a course, if you will, that the council members go through. It is uh, mandatory education for us. And um, so this is our education session for the current term of office. Go ahead, Mr. Graham. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, and uh, good afternoon, uh, you know, Mayor Easton and, and Councillors. Um, I'd like to make a few opening comments on why we're here and the importance of today's workshop. Uh, Council will be receiving the standard of care training uh, for providing safe drinking water uh, to our community. The standard of care legislation falls under the Safe Drinking Water Act and applies to people with decision-making authority over municipal drinking water systems. Um, the main goal of the training is to remind council of the responsibilities for providing safe drinking water and the importance of providing safe drinking water for, for public health. Um, I'd also like to thank Brian for being here today and, and look forward to his presentation. So thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for coming and uh, we're all ears. Yeah, yeah, good. <clears throat> Great. Okay, thank you, it's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've been looking after this training for the Walker and Clean Water Center since we originally developed this course in 2011, 2012, and it's uh, something that I think I think I figured I've trained over 3,000 councillors across Ontario now. So, uh, and and many repeat because it's a uh, number of people have been through it a few times. It's um, particularly interesting too. Uh, I'm going to go through some introductions in a minute, but I wanted to set the stage with my own personal career in drinking water of 44 years. Uh, and half of my career roughly was prior to the Walkerton tragedy and the other half was roughly was after the Walkerton tragedy and so I kind of can see what how it was before and how it is now and to be perfectly honest to some uh, degree I feel like I'm preaching to the converted um, because a lot of people are really on board with this now which is absolutely fantastic but we're going to talk today about um, some very significant, a uh, couple of changes, but significant responsibility that councillors do have. We're going to start off with some introductions. We're going to talk about um, recognizing what your duty and responsibilities are as, as members of council, uh, staying informed and how you stay informed and what's being asked of you, um, looking around for things that might be going wrong, uh, in other words, just exercising vigilance over the system. Uh, and then we talk about a couple of case studies at the end, very short module. I wish we had more time to go into more detail of, of the case studies because case studies are always good for training because it makes things real. Um, there's a couple we have in here. Um, so the, the main key messages, messages here are to recognize what your main responsibilities are. Um, also, some questions you might have uh, and, and hopefully we'll be able to answer some of those questions. And again, we're gonna, this hopefully at the end, we'll discuss maybe what we've learned, summarize what we've learned here today. So first off, uh, some, some introductions. Um, I don't think we have to go into a whole lot of detail here. This is probably for my benefit as much as anybody, but maybe give me an idea of how long you've been on council and uh, if there's anything of particular interest uh, to you. So I could start off, again, 44 years. I started my career with the Ministry of Environment. I worked for a coagulant manufacturer. I worked for an equipment manufacturer. And then in 2008, I went back to the Walker and Clean Water Center. 
I retired in 2019, uh, but I'm still doing some work with the center um, uh, training, contract training. So, um, spent a lot of time working on exotic contaminants. In fact, uh, I went to Brock and actually played hockey at the Jordan Arena in the past, a few years ago, obviously. Uh, but no, I, I love it down here. I just think this is an absolutely one of the nicest parts of Ontario and it's just a, a pleasure and I may even think about moving down here at some point in the near future. But um, I, I've got, a, I've always liked water, always been interested in water and uh, did spend quite a bit of time with uh, the uh, DQ plant in the past and uh, the, if the Rose Hill plant in Fort Erie and to a lesser extent the Grimsby plant. So I'm familiar with water. Uh, I probably don't have all the answers but I can probably find them. So feel free to ask questions. I'd prefer to keep it informal if, if, it's, uh, if it works uh, for everybody. So maybe just a quick, again, a quick round of introductions just so I know where you're all coming from and could start with you, Dave, you're the Director of Public Works. And Yeah, uh, th through you, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, <clears throat> Dave Graham, Director of Public Works. So, okay, so I've got a, a level one license in okay. water distribution. Okay, good. Yeah, we're gonna talk a little about certification yeah. as we go forward. And Councillor Timmers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks so much for being here tonight. So I am a third term councillor. Okay. And um, I'm very interested in water as well. Uh, just a little personal side note. I've had a well for 25 years. And I just graduated to a uh, cistern. And so now I'm buying water. Okay. So I, I'm very interested to learn a little bit about those, about the cisterns and, and potable water that you know, our residents are buying. There's a lot of us that do. And maybe one day I'll have tap water. Okay. And I can use it endlessly without worrying my alarm's gonna go off in the middle of the night. So you live, uh, you live <laughs> rural? I do. Okay, great, great. Yeah. No, Thank uh, you. So now thanks. you know my whole story. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Anna Murray. I'm a first term counselor. So this is my first uh, training on, on the Safe Water Act. I'm um, interested in learning more. Uh, like Lynn, I also have a well. Uh, I have lots of experience with all kinds of different filtration systems and uh, ultraviolet. And that's just for me in my house. I can only imagine how challenging it is for the entire municipality. So I'm very interested. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Councillor J.D. Pachareva, six-term councillor, uh, former infrastructure chair. Dave and his team have made me into a bit of a water nerd. Uh, you know, uh, our I&I &I study and Berlina system and going through and looking at things and and uh, just I, from this course, Brian, I know the ramifications of um, Flint, well, Flint's new, uh, Walkerton, um, where was the car wash? Stratford. Strat see, so, yeah. And so, on and on and on. There on and on and on. Unbelievable and, number of uh, disasters. That yeah, and, and, and I'm on um, the Community Cares uh, Building Committee, and we have a fire stack there mm -hmm. that needs a backflow preventer, and trying to tell them why, because if a fire starts in the reverse pressure, and it's, I was under the impression it was just water, but there's chemical in there, so... You don't want to be the one that contaminates the water system and sends me to jail. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Julie Kirklos, the town clerk, so I'm looking forward to learning all about this. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. And Sandra okay. and then Ms. Diane. Uh, Diane Ritchima, this is my fourth term on council. And so I've taken this course a couple of times and it's always interesting. It's obviously very important because we know that we're personally liable for the water system. Um, so that's where my interest lies, just to make sure that we're always doing enough to, to make sure that we're vigilant and we're doing our due diligence and carrying on our ongoing duties. Um, and I guess we're going to hear more about that tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mike Mikulik. I'm uh, representing people in the east end of town. I, uh, I do have city water. I do appreciate it. Uh, this morning I took a shower. Um, I drink the water right out of the tap. Uh, some of us in the house 
that I live with, they still buy bottled water, but not myself. I, uh, I, I, I appreciate the water that we provide ourselves, so thank you. Great, thanks. Welcome, Brian. Uh, Greg, Re Councilor Greg Reimer. I'm a second term councillor. Um, during my day job, I am a uh, licensed by the Ministry of Housing and Rural Affairs to install and design septic systems. Okay. Our company does municipal water systems as well, so install cisterns and wells and that kind of thing. So come at it from a different angle, but very sure. interested to learn more, always. Okay, well, so, that's great. Welcome. Thanks. I'm very pleased that you're here, Brian. And uh, as I said to you earlier, we're going to be looking for some um, for some exciting elements to this program because we've all been through it a few times. I've been on council 15 years. Six of those were pre-Walkerton, not six, 15 consecutive years, right, but right. six, and then this is my ninth year. And um, I've had city water. We have a sister now, but I have a very high level of confidence in the water quality that we have within the region of Niagara, so I'm not concerned about it. And my husband's a good measurer. He's, a free, he's obsessive about measuring the water for the reasons that uh, Councillor Timmer was referring to. But I've also lived with the use of ultraviolet at our cottage, and, um, and that's kind of a different experience, of course, because... Uh, there's a tendency for people to want to have uh, bottled water all the time. So it's just another dimension of life that you, you learn about and you learn to live with. What I re really appreciate about this course is that no one has decided that it shouldn't continue, which I think is very, very important. And the other thing is that um, the manual is getting thicker, not thinner, which is a good sign that there's more learning and uh, that it's um, being uh, being taken very seriously. Right, right. So I'm um, now I'm going to turn to we've got two councillors on the on the screen. So Councillor Russell, go ahead. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, my name is Adam Russell. Uh, I am a second-term councillor. Uh, again, it's interesting to hear everybody's uh, variation of water stories. Uh, we also have a place up north, and for our drinking water, we uh, use spring water. Uh, so by all means, if uh, you have a couple minutes to touch on the safety of spring water, uh, by all means throw it in there, because uh, we've been using it, uh, again, I think the, the town up there's been using it for years as well. It's just a, a pipe out of the ground. The water runs the same uh, flow rate uh, all year round, doesn't matter how cold it is, uh, and the temperature of the water is exactly the same. So if it's minus 10 or uh, 35, uh, it's always the same temperature, so it's, it's fascinating. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Councillor. Councillor Brunet? Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Good to see you again, Brian. Uh, third term councillor, uh, taking your training before, and look forward to hearing uh, all the new changes, and it's always good to have training, especially on something that we're responsible for, like clean water. Thank you for, for being here today. Okay. So... Go ahead, Brian. Yep. Well, thank you for uh, those comments. Um, uh, I don't have, uh, this is really focused on municipal tap water as opposed to private wells and, and springs. Um, there's a lot of really good, uh, amazing quality groundwater out there, both in the wells and in the springs. Um, but it is site specific. It's quite, it's hard to make a general statement about a, about a spring. Um, but for the most part, if it's a deep, secure well and the temperature is constant year-round, then... But I would su still suggest testing. I mean, you know, testing, especially for pathogens, bacteriological testing is, is always recommended no matter what. And you'll probably see why in a few minutes. So um, just to start off, a quick message here from the former Chief Drinking Water Inspector, Melissa Thompson. And she really uh, suggests that um, councillors, people making decisions, do have a serious and somewhat unique ro uh, role in protecting the public health of the community. But it's interesting, I like to carry this a step further and say not just the public health, it's the economic health of the community as well that's at stake here. And when we uh, look at the, the outfall of the Walkerton tragedy, um, the property values in Walkerton plummeted for quite a number of years. They've pretty much recovered now, but they, uh, they, they were significantly lower, reduced for a number of years. Um, not to mention the fact that Walkerton will probably always have a stigma associated with it. And that's not the kind of stigma you want to have. 
Um, when I was with the Walkerton Center, I got a call from a guy who wanted to come and talk to our operators about the profound effect that the Walkerton tragedy had on his operations. He was from Australia. So this was heard around the world. So. Um, again, most people are somewhat familiar at least with what happened in the Walkerton tragedy. I did this session down in Windsor back in January and one of the councillors put up his hand and said, uh, excuse me, Brian, he said, I wasn't even born in May of 2000. So we're getting to the point where there, there, there are going to be newer councillors coming on board and they're just, they've never heard of it. They don't know anything about it. So just a quick recount of what happened. Um, again, it was unusually heavily rained, so not, not unlike what we have out there today. Uh, the well was not properly maintained and became contaminated. Uh, the disinfection wasn't being applied properly and the general manager did not report his test results um, as reported to him. He falsified, he, he, he lied to the health unit. Uh, about half the population of the town of Walkerton, 5,400 people, 5,300 people became sick. 65 people were hospitalized and 27 developed this serious kidney disease. Uh, seven people died as a result of this tragedy, but in reality, um, there's quite a few more than that. We could say uh, were uh, directly perished as a result of this tragedy. A number of people have passed away since that have had kidney you know, complications with uh, kidney infections and kidney disease. And there was an interesting article in May of 2018 in the Toronto Star about a gentleman who was at home visiting his mother on that, uh, that weekend, the long weekend in May. He didn't even live in Walkerton. He was visiting his mom. It was a hot, long weekend. He drank a pitcher of water and came down with, um, it's called CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, which is an autoimmune disorder where it paralyzes your muscles. And he slowly, over a period of 18 years, went downhill and finally was given permission to kill himself with doctor-assisted suicide directly as a result of that slow, and when they, when they approve that, then there's no possible way you're gonna pull out of it. They, they, they look really carefully at the disease. My daughter had a similar episode with a disease that's called a little bit different, it's called Yambaré syndrome. It's an autoimmune attack, a bit like multiple sclerosis. Um, she was four years old, um, and the stress that caused on our family, just, you know, hard to even fathom. And um, so, you know, we see seven deaths, we think, okay, well, seven or eight or nine. But the effect on the family is just unbelievable. Anybody who's had a family member on dialysis. So it goes, goes way beyond the numbers we see and we read regularly. Uh, there was a public inquiry called to figure out what happened, and, and, and the second phase was to try and figure out what to do about it. Uh, we're going to sort of cover off a little bit of that as we go forward. A little bit more background on the actual disaster was um, the well was commissioned in 1978. Every single test from that well showed sign of contamination. There was never a clear sample from that well. That well should never have been approved in the first place, which is probably the number one failure of the province. The Ministry of Environment should never give an approval to, to run that well. What they did say was, okay, you can use the well as a backup well, but you have to chlorinate. It wasn't a requirement for all wells to use chlorine at the time. Um, and they said you should be decommissioning that well and, and, and looking for a new well. Uh, the town chose not to decommission the well, and they continued to use it as a backup well, and in some cases a production well. Uh, and the ministry didn't follow up on their order to decommission the well. So you could look at the failure of both the, the town and, and, the, and the ministry, um, to be perfectly honest. Uh, furthermore, on top of all that, there were no inspections done of the well throughout the 80s. Again, uh, the province could be, um, you know, looked at, uh, and again, they, they, it was failure on the part of the province, no question. Uh, but it goes beyond that. The chlorine, uh, this is very polite, the chlorine was not being properly applied. The, the operator was falsifying all the records. He was supposed to be measuring his chlorine residual every day. Uh, we add chlorine to water. Um, some of the, the water uses up some of the chlorine, and what's left over is called the chlorine residual. So that's what's doing the work. So he would do his chlorine residual tests every day. Um, or he would say that he did them. What he actually would do at the start of every month, he'd fill out all the results for the month ahead and put the clipboard back up on the wall, essentially falsifying all the records for the month going forward. People say, why? I don't know why. I really don't have a good answer for that, except maybe he thought that these rules were stupid and he shouldn't be following them. I don't know. I really don't know. I'll never know. But he did testify. He, he testified at the inquiry that this is what he did. Uh, so the chlorine wasn't properly, being properly applied. He didn't even know what was there. Um, the uh, health expert said there's no possible way there was any chlorine because it would have killed these bacteria. 
Chlorine is, if anybody ever complains about the smell and taste of chlorine in their water, um, you just have to remind them the chlorine's there for a very good reason, and it's there to kill pathogens that can actually kill people in a short period of time. On top of that, um, the, the general manager of the Public Utilities Commission uh, received a telephone call from the lab that did the testing that told him the results were bad, the samples had failed, they were laced with bacteria, and they faxed the test results to him. So he knew absolutely, unequivocally, that the test was bad. And on three occasions after that, when the health unit contacted him to ask about the water samples, he said things were fine. So he lied to the health unit directly. Uh, again, a combination of things. Um, the farmer wasn't doing anything wrong, but it was as a result of manure that he'd spread on full frozen ground uh, that got into the well and contaminated the well system. He was following the best practices at the time. They've changed since then, but he was not doing anything uh, that he shouldn't have been doing. The, uh, the Walkerton inquiry from Justice Dennis O'Connor uh, said failure at all levels. That was the summary of the whole thing. Virtually all levels failed, including the province. I mean, you can't, you can't shy away from the fact that the regulatory part of it was a big component. I mean, it was. Um, complacency was evident at most levels, no question. And there were a whole bunch of things that came together to cause this problem. Uh, and really, uh, we could say the problem had been occurring for 22 years. In fact, when you talk to people that raised kids in the Walkerton area and, and, and Mild May and Hanover and other neighboring towns, when they sent their kids to uh, Walkerton for ballet lessons or hockey games, whatever, they tell their kids not to drink the water. There was this underlying knowledge that the Walkerton water was not, uh, was maybe not always bad, but sometimes it was bad. So it had been happening for 22 years. It wasn't until the big one, where a lot of people got sick, where the healthcare system noticed it and started to look for it. One of the things that bothers me the most about this goes back to chlorine again. The tiniest little bit of chlorine would have killed these. These are bacteria, and almost all bacteria are very effectively controlled by chlorine. And the tiniest little bit of chlorine in this water would have prevented this from happening. Uh, as a result of the tragedy, um, we came up with, uh, the province came up with a whole bunch of recommendations and regulations and changes. Um, and it, it, one of the changes was well, why we're here today, really talking about um, the fact that anybody who's making decisions over a municipal drinking water system has uh, direct responsibility and needs to be accountable to the consumer. So. Uh, there are 121 different recommendations that came from the uh, phase two report of the Walkerton inquiry. Uh, starting with source protection, uh, that was uh, one of the recommendations. Um, makes perfect sense. Keep, keep the contaminants out of the water in the first place. You don't have to worry about them. Uh, the next uh, one is standards and technology. Standards, that's a drinking water quality uh, requirements, so the specific parameters that we're measuring and monitoring, and we have to meet those standards. The technology is more about the equipment we use and the um, and the, and the classification of the equipment we use and, and uh, other factors that relate to the uh, regulatory uh, regime for, for treatment technologies. Uh, also, uh, the water providers like municipalities under the um, requirement to have a drinking water quality management system in place to meet the drinking water quality management standard. We often just call this a QMS, quality management. It's like an ISO uh, registration. It's a, it's a sort of a quality management requirement and there is a requirement for municipal water systems. Uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act, again introduced by the province, that was something that was recommended to bring out a, a, a regular. We had objectives before uh, this, so there were drinking water objectives, but if you didn't meet them, it was a sort of a slap on the wrist. It wasn't, you know, there might be political pressure to meet them, but it wasn't a really a, a significant uh, penalty or anything associated with not meeting regulations or, or objectives. And then, so the Safe Drinking Water Act brought about regulations where they're legally enforceable. And then there were some special cases aimed at small systems and First Nations that uh, were part of the 121 recommendations from the Walkerton Inquiry. Um, Justice Dennis O'Connor, who was a man I have a tremendous amount of respect for because he took a, a really difficult subject and distilled a whole lot of information down into some really good concrete recommendations. Uh, I should point out, I believe all of the recommendations have now been implemented successfully. So uh, that's a feather in his cap as well. We had a trainer's gathering in November at, in the Walkerton uh, Clean Water Center and he came out and he's just absolutely delighted that this has gone the way it has and that he is so happy to have been part of this. 
But he's really talking here about um, uh, making sure that people who are making decisions over drinking water systems provide a high degree of public accountability. So really the people making decisions are accountable and need to be accountable to the public. There, um, when you really think about it, I mentioned uh, public health is, is obviously huge. Uh, economic health is really important. There, I, I did a session, this session for Peel a couple weeks ago, Peel Regional Government, and I was sat through uh, part of the first parts of the council meeting, it was an actual council meeting, and they had um, a delegation from the uh, elder care, people looking after the people, the older folks in the community. Uh, very significant, um, looking for resources, obviously. Then there was another delegation from uh, the homeless community looking for ways to deal with uh, the homeless encampments and such. Another very significant, very uh, looking for resources, very difficult, challenging. And I was thinking about that. It was, it was you know, heart-wrenching to see these things happening. But on the other hand, drinking water affects virtually everybody in your municipality, one way or another, if you're using tap water. If you're on well water, it's a little bit different. Uh, but if you, anybody who's using tap water, virtually everybody in the municipality is affected by it um, for, for, for obvious reasons. So even people drinking bottled water, people taking showers can still be affected by drinking water. So, so it affects everybody. It's a very significant uh, issue. Um, in terms of responsibilities, there's kind of a blend here between the legal responsibilities and the moral or ethical responsibilities. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the legal responsibilities under the Safe Drinking Water Act, specifically Section 11, Section 19 of the, of the Act. And I'll cover those off in more detail. Um, but there are also these ethical responsibilities that are really, again, moral. Uh, it is your duty. Uh, you need to be informed and you should be vigilant. They can't regulate that you be informed. <laughs> but it's, it's now, it was interesting, uh, a couple of folks here have a tremendous amount of experience in water sitting on your council. So this is really good for uh, you know, knowledge, the knowledge base of council, which is great. Um, but you do, um, you do need to keep yourself informed. No expectation of expert level knowledge whatsoever, but you need to be informed. And the staff are almost always willing to bring information forward and help, help you with being informed. So, so the first module is uh, recognizing your duty what I would suggest we do is go for module one and two and then maybe take a short bio break with, uh, with your um, sure. uh, approval and, uh, and then we can move forward. So hopefully you'll be able to recognize the regulatory side of things um, in this first module. Uh, this is not all that new. The Safe Drinking Water Act has been around in the United States since the mid-70s. So this isn't terribly new. In fact, it's called the same thing. But the recommendation from this phase two of the Walkerton inquiry was the government should bring out, put in place a Safe Drinking Water Act to deal with uh, treatment and distribution of water. So that's exactly what happened. And uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act came out in 2002. And I remember being involved in the development of the Safe Drinking Water Act and providing comments through to the ministry and uh, it was a flurry of activity. Um, they, uh, the following year in 2003, they came out with the regulations 169, which was dealing specifically with the parameters we have to meet. Uh, and then Regulation 170, which as I mentioned before, is really the treatment equipment and the classification of systems. Then in 2006, Clean Water came Act, uh, Act came out that was um, source protection. That was all about protecting your source water. And then one of the newer things, although it would have been in place, I believe, last time we did this training, but it was um, in 2017, the Asset Management Planning requirement it came out, I'm not sure when the effective date was, I might have missed your, uh, your last council meeting, I'm not sure. But there is a requirement now for asset management planning for municipal infrastructure. Now, um, Mayor Easton mentioned earlier that the books were very thick, and part of the reason for that is the last half of your manual, Appendix A, uh, is the entire guidebook uh, published by the Ministry. We put that together many years ago, but it's a guidebook for councillors and decision makers. So it really goes through pretty much what we're talking about today in more detail. And it talks, uh, it also has some questions at the end, maybe we think they should be able to answer, like to help you be informed, uh, get these answers from your, your people. Uh, but it's a good resource and uh, and I would have, you know, if, you, if you're, you go, you know, if you have any questions, go to it first and, and, and see if it can help you. And, uh, and we'll always be there to help you as well. One thing I should point out, I'm gonna mention at the very end, but I'll mention it now, if you ever have any questions about anything to do with water, 
uh, drinking water especially, not as much wastewater, but, but mostly drinking water. The Walker and Clean Water Center has a resource library. And if you go to wcwc.ca and click on resource library, you'll be inundated with every possible thing about drinking water you could ever, every question, every report. Uh, and the good thing about it is it's all been vetted. This is all, there's no fake news, there's no, it's all, there's no internet rabbit holes. This is, this is all really good solid information. So I would encourage anybody to go there if you're looking for information on drinking water, including cisterns and, and, uh, and private water supplies as well. Uh, okay, um, Safe Drinking Water Act has a number of different people who are regulated within it. Uh, the operators clearly have uh, 36 strict requirements under the Safe Drinking Water Act. The owners, which would be yourselves, uh, typically uh, as a representative of the council. Um, the operating authorities, who are the people that are actually uh, accredited to operate your system. In this case, it would be the corporation of the uh, town of Lincoln, I expect, for the operating authority. Uh, and or the region of Niagara has the operating authority for providing the water to you. So they're caught by the standard of care. The laboratories that do the testing uh, have to be accredited. You cannot do drinking water testing unless you're an accredited laboratory. Very strict on that. Uh, there are some situations where we are allowing or the ministry is allowing people to do some limited amount of testing on drinking water uh, at, without being a fully certified operator. And they call them trained persons, or in this case, persons testing drinking water. Uh, they're still regulated by the Safe Drinking Water Act, but there are limits to what those people can actually do. The drinking water systems themselves um, are, are regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And in some cases, we have these non-municipal drinking water systems uh, that are considered to be what they call designated facilities. I don't know if you operate any uh, in, in the area, any parks, trailer parks, campgrounds. So you have some of these facilities. And some are designated and some are not. The ones that are designated, usually feeding kids, um, usually kids or, or perhaps an old folks uh, elder care home, um, that might be a designated facility if you were serving that uh, with your water system. Um, so they're also caught by the standard of care. The, the, the differentiation for me is you could have uh, two hockey camps. One hockey camp is for kids, one hockey camp is for adults. They're identical in every respect. They have their own water systems. We're talking about ones that actually have their own small water systems. Um, but identical in every respect. The one that serves kids would be a designated facility regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. The one that serves adults wouldn't. It would fall under a different, actually a different ministry does the inspections on it. It's just because the, the adults are not a susceptible part of the population. The kids are, so. <clears throat> Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but hey, these things don't always make sense necessarily. <laughs> Uh, but there, there's logic to it. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the different parts. We're going to zoom in here on the general requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, obviously, there's a, there's a lot of information in this in this act. Um, the general requirements are, are what we're going to sort of zero in on here, specifically Section 11. And these are the duties of the owners and the operating authorities. So this is what, as an owner, you are ultimately responsible for. And that is to make sure, to ensure the water meets the standards. So the water has to be of certain quality. Uh, the system has to be run by certified operators, qualified people. Uh, you have to make sure that the sampling, monitoring, testing, and reporting are all in compliance. And you have to use an accredited lab. When I say you as the owner are responsible, you're ultimately responsible. Staff are doing all these things behind the scenes. And if staff weren't doing them and weren't doing them properly, you would have heard about it. And I did have a quick look at your summary report, and you got 100% compliance, which you can't do better than that. <laughs> well, people talk about 110% all the time. The hockey, hockey players always do. That always bothers me, because there's no such thing. But you really can't do better. So that's a real feather in your cap as a, as a, as a utility. Um, boy, oh boy, that's fantastic. Um, and that means also, too, that these things are being done and being done very effectively by staff already. Now, I, I like to look at a lot of these uh, requirements, especially under the Safe Drinking Water Act. They're for the protection of public health, sure, but they're for the protection of you. They're for the protection of the operators. If it's for everybody, not just the public. This actually protects you because these things are flagged, and if things aren't going wrong, they'll tell you about it, and you can fix them. So, so that's the duties of the owner and operating authority under Section 11. 
There is a, a slight exception here with the accredited operating authority. And what happened was when the Safe Drinking Water Act first came into play, a lot of people thought, well, we'll just hire a Aqua or a Veolia or a private you know, operating authority to run our system. We won't have to worry about it. Uh, Ontario Clean Water Agency, they operate a lot of systems around. And, um, but that's not the case because if anybody who signs off on that operating authority is still caught by the standard of care. So you got to make sure that the operating authority is carrying out their responsibilities. If it's staff in-house, it's, it's different. The operating authority, the Dave will come to the council meetings and present his information. So uh, it's a little different when you have a, th a third party operating authority, but the rules are still the same. You're still responsible for them to make sure they're doing their job properly. Uh, section 19 uh, takes it a little bit of a step further, and this talks about the specific responsibility of people making decisions over drinking water systems, and this typically applies to the owner, which would be um, council. Uh, in some cases, we have corporate ownership of our drinking water systems. Not too often, but uh, part of the city of Greater Sudbury. Uh, their municipal drinking water system is, is owned by Valet Mining Company, part of. In the past, um, the entire town of Viroqua Falls, their entire water, municipal water system was owned by Abitibi Bowwater, Pulp and Paper Company. It is no longer, um, but it used to be. And there are still some mining towns up around Red Lake in northern, uh, northwestern Ontario that have corporate ownership of the drinking water systems. And if that's the case, every officer and director of that drinking water system is caught by the standard of care. And as I mentioned, anybody that oversees the operating authority. So that was, uh, and, and the way that it's written is, is the, anybody who's making decisions over the drinking water system needs to exercise the care to ensure the protection and safety of the user of the system. Um, again, there's, there's a couple of other uh, phrases in there. Um, you must use the, the care that a reasonably prudent person would be expected to exercise. So it's, uh, um, the, the, the other side of it too is it also asks um, you to act honestly, competently, with integrity, and I think that's something the electorate would expect anyway. Now, this last point here is an interesting one, and I would absolutely be trusting information coming to you from staff. Staff have a vested interest in the operation, you know, the smooth operation of a, of a facility and the, and the equipment. Uh, so the information that the, the staff will be bringing you is going to be solid. But there may be occasions where you've got, well, there would be occasions where you've got competition for resources. Every municipality is going to have competition for resources. Um, you may be struggling with a decision that you have to make. Uh, staff may be telling you we need to, you know, re recoat the, the storage tower. Uh, but you've got other serious competition. And there are some situations where you may actually want to reach out to get some additional assistance from an outside source. Um, okay, staff are going to be bringing you solid information. There are also rare occasions where staff don't always agree on what the, what the solution is. So you can end up with these uh, unusual situations. If that's the case and you wanted to reach out to an outside source for information to help you make your decision, um, you're encouraged to do that. Uh, I would get, um, it has to be qualified professional of some sort you're reaching out to. It could be a peer municipality, it doesn't necessarily have to cost money. Uh, consultant, engineer, lawyer, depending on the nature of the question. But if you reach out and get information from an outside source and you act on that information and something goes wrong as a result of you acting on that information, you'll not be held accountable under the standard of care. It's only fair, but this is, this is one of the little caveats in here that uh, if you did reach out for that information and it turned out something you know, happened that was you know, unfavorable, uh, you wouldn't be held accountable. So. Uh, just a, a, a little um, thing there, I think in some cases you may be wanting to do this to reach out for some decisions, but I would say we're quite rare, for the most part, the information the staff's bringing you is going to be absolutely solid. But again, you have tough, tough decisions to make. I, I don't envy uh, people on council for a minute. In terms of enforcement, uh, if a provincial officer feels that uh, someone has breached their responsibility, uh, they can uh, uh, assess a, a penalty. The maximum penalty is $4 million and up to uh, five years in jail. I can guarantee you the ministry is not sitting here waiting to lay this charge. Uh, of course, we're all hoping it never does happen. It's never been tested yet, and we really don't think it ever will be with any luck, but it is there nonetheless. 
Uh, obviously, if something really serious did happen and God forbid we had tragic loss of life, then the penalties are liable to be more severe uh, if it's something that was uh, as a result of a breach of responsibility. But again, it would, uh, it would have to be something fairly significant for them to lay uh, fines, penalties. So, uh, really quickly, um, quick review of what we just covered. What act uh, outlines duties under the standard of care? What act outlines duties under the standard of care? So where does the standard of care fit in? Under what act does the standard of care fit? Me. Safe drinking water, absolutely. I don't like the wording of that question, actually. Um, only drinking water system owners and operating authorities are regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. False, for sure, everyone's shaking their head. Um, which section of the Safe Drinking Water Act prescribes systems operated by qualified persons? 11, absolutely. Uh, and then, um, uh, which section outlines responsibility for management of the drinking water system? And that's the, the only one that's left. Section B? Section 19? Yeah. Yeah. Talks about the management of the drinking water system. So the second module is staying informed. A little bit of basic information about some of the systems we might have out there. And ideally we can, uh, we'd be able to understand the, the sort of the source to tap approach from, um, of, of safe drinking water. We're also going to talk about a concept called the multi-barrier approach that you probably have heard before if you've been through this training. Uh, it's a concept that's um, been around for, for many decades now, but it kind of makes sense. It works well. And again, look at the responsibilities within each of these barriers, responsibilities of decision makers. So you've all seen the uh, water cycle before. This is the municipal water cycle. Um, it really is, is quite straightforward. It just talks about uh, water coming in either from the surface of a lake or river or from a well groundwater into your treatment works, whatever that treatment works looks like. Could be just simple chlorination, it could be a full-blown drinking water plant. Uh, into the distribution system, the pipes in the ground, the linear assets, through the storage towers perhaps, reservoirs, uh, past the fire hydrants in the uh, municipality for fighting fires, uh, flowing into the place of business or residence, um, used by people in the you know business or residence, um, for whatever you would normally use water for, irrigation, washing, cleaning, uh, any number of different things. Uh, the water would then exit from that uh, building and go into the collection system for the wastewater, uh, through the wastewater plant, and then back into the receiving water. So again, pretty straightforward. Uh, virtually all systems work this way to some degree or other on the municipal side of things. Uh, just a, a little bit more on surface water. Now, you are receiving all of your municipal water from either Lake Ontario or from the DQ plant. Um, is that, are, they, uh, are they up to uh, Lake Erie on that plant? Did they draw water from Lake Erie? Gibson, the, Gibson. Gibson Lake? Gibson, okay, yes. from, from Lake Erie into Gibson Lake? Okay. So, surface water in both cases. So, uh, that's you know, one different tri type of water. Uh, we also have two different types of groundwater for anybody who's on a private well. And the groundwater can be described as what we call goody, groundwater under the direct influence of surface water, uh, or non-goody, which is a deep, secure well, typically safer. Um, the groundwater under the direct influence, uh, there are different treatment requirements for these types, of, uh, these types of systems that I'll talk more about now. The requirement for treating water that comes from the surface, lake or river, uh, is uh, chemically assisted filtration, coagulation, flocculation, filtration, called conventional treatment. And typically you'd have a filter on there, and again, the big plants, uh, DQ and Grimsby and Rose Hill and Niagara Falls, uh, all have these this type of a system. This is a, a tried and true technology. Uh, it's been around for many years, and it works extremely well, very efficient, very effective. Um, and it's capable of dealing with the huge range of different uh, contaminants and, and pathogens, especially. The, the, the aim of treatment is to remove pathogenic organisms. That's the primary goal. So that's what you would need to do, and that's what the region's doing for you in, in operating the plants that they're running. The uh, groundwater systems, uh, there's slightly different treatment requirements for them. 
depending on whether it's one of these wells that's connected to the surface, the ground, under the direct influence of surface water, and this is where you typically need to filter it, although you can uh, get away with uh, just UV treatment, um, but the, the recommended uh, treatment for this is filtration. And for the wells that are really truly deep secure wells, um, all you really need to do is disinfect it with chlorine. Uh, no requirement for treatment, any further treatment. So that's the treatment side of things, the distribution side. Now you can have a lot of money tied up in your linear assets, and this is mostly what you would be looking after because you don't, uh, the, the region's looking after the treatment work, so really you're responsible for the distribution uh, in your uh, municipality. Uh, and there are many, many millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, tied up in your uh, distribution system. And one of the problems with distribution systems in general is they're out of sight, right? You don't, you don't see them. They're, things are happening underground. And you're not, you're not going to notice them. They're buried. Uh, so, from a political point of view, and decision makers' point of view, you could um, take your two or five or ten million dollars and put it into the ground and cover it all over. Cause traffic chaos as you're digging it all up. Have all the businesses screaming at you for disrupting their activities. Uh, take your millions of dollars and, and bury the pipe in the ground, and then no one ever sees it again. So that could be a difficult decision to be making as a council because it's not, you know, you know, you may know it's the right thing to do, um, but in, in a lot of cases it is, especially if you've got a, a, a section of pipe that needs to be uh, replaced because of continual leaks and problems with it. Um, and again, looking after your assets is, is, is critically important, and it's a requirement on the asset management uh, planning going forward for infrastructure. But these can be really complex. You can have different pressure zones. You can have hydrants and meters and reservoirs and pumping stations and rechlorination systems, which I expect you do have here for uh, rechlorination of uh, boosting the chlorine. Uh, you know, huge numbers of components. Uh, I think you have somewhere over 100 kilometers of, of water main in the ground between the two, uh, two systems. So a lot of money tied up in the distribution and really good to maintain it properly. There's a couple more reasons I'm going to talk about going forward why it's so critical to repair leaks in the water mains. I'll cover that off when we get for going forward. Um, not a bad idea to get it familiar with your organization chart within your municipality. Typically look like this, but it depends entirely on your system and, and how you're set up. Um, the, they typically are uh, is a compliance person now, especially with the Safe Drinking Water Act. All of a sudden there's a new position on that org chart as a result of the Safe Drinking Water Act, that's a person just strictly to deal with compliance because there's a lot to deal with. Uh, so that's, that's newer, I suppose. Um, but again, this, this looks completely different. Not a bad idea to just familiarize yourself with your structure within your organization. A uh, really quick word on the role of the operator. Operators have a tremendous amount of responsibility. Uh, they're, they're looking after um, the day-to-day -day activities uh, not so much at the facility, but in the distribution system for your, in your case. There's alarms that would go off. For example, if the chlorine residual got too low, you would be called out and try to uh, respond to an emergency like that. Um, you have to operate in accordance with the standard operating procedures that are in place for your system, including things like water main repair procedures, which are fairly clearly laid out by the ministry. There's very strict rules you have to follow if you're repairing a water main break. You're adjusting the equipment, they're sampling, they're monitoring, they're, they're reporting on the, uh, uh, on, on the equipment maintenance they're doing, they're reporting on their log books of their activities. And um, there, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of work that an operator typically does on a regular basis. If anybody ever wonders, go and talk to them and follow them around for a day because they're doing a lot of different things. Uh, there's different levels of operators, typically starting with the, the most junior, which is the operator in training. This is what a lot of um, uh, people will come out of community colleges. I believe Niagara College is still running the uh, water operator uh, courses here. So you'll have someone coming out of uh, fresh out of school with an operator training uh, license in their pocket. Uh, this allows them to do limited things, so it's not really a full-on license yet. Uh, they then would work their way up from class one to class four. Uh, you're a class two system here in distribution. Is that right for your whole, for your whole system? So you would never really need a class three or four operator necessarily. Um, which is good news because the, uh, the higher you go in the classifications, the more difficult it is to attain a class four and to hire a class four if you ever needed to. 
Uh, in addition to that, you have the operator in charge designation, who is the person that's sort of uh, responsible on a sh for a given shift, and then the overall responsible operator who has ultimate responsibility over the system. They have their own rules and penalties and uh, very rigorous requirements. Um, again, it's one of those situations you couldn't just hire someone off the, treat, uh, the street and tell them they're a class four operator. Uh, it could take up to eight years to train someone up to that level. Another thing about operators is it's one of the very few professions where they have to recertify every three years. So they have to take training, mandatory training every three years in order to maintain their license. If they don't, uh, they'll lose their license. Uh, succession planning is, is absolutely key, and I'm sure you're well aware of that already, but I, I, it's, uh, operators are getting more and more difficult to uh, find and to uh, replace as people retire. Uh, Justice O'Connor and Dr. Steve Hurdy are a couple of people. I mentioned Justice O'Connor earlier. He did the, uh, the judge for the Walkerton Inquiry. He says that operational personnel should be given the status, the training, the compensation that compares with their responsibilities. Um, there was a time in the past where the custodian in the Owen Sound Library was earning more money than the water plant operators were. And not that money is everything, but it's generally an indication of responsibility. And it's no longer the case, but it's just, that's how it used to be. That was a mindset. That was, that was the old days. And uh, operators have, a, have, have really come up and, and, and you know, extremely, extremely well educated and now compared to the old days. Another uh, person uh, I've got a lot of respect for is Dr. Steve Rudy. He's a retired professor from the University of Alberta. He's a medical doctor, went back and did his PhD in engineering, was teaching engineering at the University of Alberta. And one of the leading people in the English-speaking world on safe drinking water, just a terrific, uh, terrific guy and a terrific resource. We had him come do a bunch of seminars for us in Walkerton. Uh, and he said, you can take a really good operator and make them complacent by not giving them the tools they need to do the job properly. And I'm not talking about buying them a new truck every year. I mean, more about the, the tools they really need to rely on that they need to do their jobs, like measuring chlorine residual and simple things like that. We want to avoid complacency. So, uh, multi-barrier approach. Uh, this has been around for about 30 years. It was originally developed by the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment. And it's really a concept where we have all these different barriers in place to help ensure safe drinking water starting with source water protection, uh, treatment is the next barrier, distribution is the next barrier, monitoring, testing, sampling is the next barrier, and then management is the final barrier. And all of these work together to help ensure safe drinking water. Uh, it's important to recognize that just having these barriers isn't really good enough. They need to be optimized. They need to be working properly. And when we look at the history of waterborne disease, I've been spending uh, quite a bit of time. I've got a, a couple of courses I developed, and one of them in particular was looking at the history of disease outbreaks over the last 20 years around the world. And it's when two or more of these barriers fail that you have problems. And uh, sometimes if one barrier fails, the other barriers are tough enough, strong enough, robust enough to pick up and not let something bad happen. If two fail, you're treading on thin ice. If two or more, three fail, four fail. In the case of the Walker and tragedy, all the barriers failed, every one of those barriers. So. Uh, it's kind of an interesting concept, um, but it, it helps you sort of compartmentalize the, the different components of a drinking water system. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of council within each of these barriers. Source water protection is the first one, and this is where you really need to look at threats uh, to your source water, and this would be things like natural causes, like storms, like we have today. If you had a shallow well or a, a groundwater under the direct influence of, of surface water, you could have an event as a result of the rainfall we saw today. Um, you can have uh, human caused agricultural runoff. Those can be uh, significantly affecting your, uh, your source water. You can have uh, septic tank failures, which would be pretty common, especially in a rural area where you don't have a sewage plant and sewage uh, collection. Um, that could be another example where you have a threat from a, from a system uh, to your, to your source, source water. Uh, lots and lots of more information on source water. There's um, and this would really pertain mostly to the region. Yes, sir. Yeah, Brian, in, in Guelph, they've got a sign like that up on Highway 6 yep. as you drive in. So does that mean their source water is... Um, Guelph's all groundwater. Okay. It's all groundwater. It's all that's well water. They yeah. they have the Nestle and, plant there. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's a different story, but yeah. Yeah, Aberfoyle, yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> a, yeah. that's a whole other... <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, this is the, this is the, just reminding people that you know 
don't pour your varsol into the yeah. <laughs> into the ground because this is your drinking water you're going to be contaminating. Um, in it's a little bit slightly different for wells than it is for surface water. For surface water, you've got an intake protection zone. This would be on the lake, for instance, your lake and your Gibson Lake and your Lake Lake Ontario. Uh, not you, but the regions would be responsible for this. You're part of it, but the regions are responsible for these. And um, just uh, but it, it makes perfect logical sense keeping the contaminants out of the water in the first place. I mean, how does that not make sense? Uh, it becomes a political issue sometimes when you've got multiple municipalities within a watershed because it's watershed based. And I think it was the Wasega Beach area. There are 22 municipalities in the watershed and trying to get them agreeing on cost sharing uh, for two municipalities, let alone 22. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, it's a challenge, absolutely. But it makes perfect logical sense. So the role really of council decision makers in this are really recognizing that you have mandatory source protection plans. You may have someone on a source protection committee on council. I'm not sure if you do, uh, wouldn't be unusual. Um, and it may be upper tier responsibility uh, on the part of, um, of the regional uh, government. Uh, but again, you possibly have vulnerabilities within your boundaries uh, where they could be affecting the, uh, the, the, the lakes potentially, like for example, leaking septic tanks. I mean, that would be uh, within your uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so these are, these are the kind of things that might, um, might be of interest um, to make sure that the source protection plans that are are, are rolled out, um, that you're aware of at least in the recommendations. And um, I'm sure Dave would be bringing those to you if there are any recommendations that we're uh, suggesting. Treatment is the next one. And again, you folks don't do a whole lot of treatment other than boosting some chlorine here and there because most of this is done at the plants, at the drinking water plants. Um, but the critical role is to remove or inactivate pathogens. Pathogens are microbiological or organisms by definition that can make people very sick and kill people in a short period of time. So that's why we're so concerned about, about uh, pathogens. There are requirements for uh, disinfection for all facilities and um, they're specified for each and every facility. So the, an engineer's report was done for all municipal drinking water systems and all the operators will know exactly what they have to do uh, to properly disinfect that water. So the role of council really in the, in the treatment barrier is to uh, ask questions, you know, ask staff uh, information, be informed. You don't have to have expert level knowledge, but be informed so that when it comes to making the decisions, you'll have a good understanding of what it is you're making decisions about. Uh, asset management is another requirement, and, um, you know, these are all assets. All of this equipment, your distribution system, these are all assets that you have. Another um, way that you could be involved is when you're approving or looking at capital uh, projects and capital upgrades. Uh, those will come across, your requests for capital will come across your table. And again, um, that's, that's part of your role is to be informed, you know, and be uh, uh, getting uh, well, well uh, you know, understanding well what's going on and what you're approving and what you're potentially not approving. Also, the trained operators, there would be uh, typically be a budget for training for operational staff. And because of the fairly significant requirements for operator training, uh, that training budget could look a little on the high side compared to some of your other staff, but it's partly because of the requirements under the Safe Drinking Water Act and the recertification and uh, a number of other uh, another a number of other elements that are involved that the training budget could actually be quite high. Um, one of the case studies I wanted to include was North Battleford, Saskatchewan. It's not in here, but one of the things that was pretty glaring in my mind when North Battleford Council was being uh, <coughs> question about their um, oversight of the water system in North Battleford. Uh, they said, we didn't spend a penny of our training <coughs> budget. We had a training budget, we didn't spend a penny. They're very proud of the fact that they didn't spend a penny of their training budget. And it led to a huge disaster where uh, quite a large number of people were sick. So, so that's the role in treatment. Uh, the next one is distribution, which is more um, relevant to you folks here. Uh, there's a number of things you need to do. Um, the, you need to be making sure that people can't get access to your storage devices, your towers, your reservoirs. And this isn't just necessarily people, this is also uh, livestock and wildlife. We see a significant number of disease outbreaks called by, caused by wildlife uh, throughout the world. So it's, it's not, uh, 
not something you have a lot of you, you don't think you have a lot of control over, but there are ways to uh, keep these uh, critters from getting into your system. One of the things that's particularly important, though, from the point of view of your distribution system is infiltration. And this is something that's really only been talked about for the last 10 or 12 years, well, maybe 15 years, um, is the fact that in our drinking water system, fully pressurized to 60 or 70 PSI throughout the system, you have these things called pressure transients, fluctuations in pressure. And it can actually cause part of the system to go into suction, to go into negative pressure, where it's actually in suction. And it surprised me when I first learned about it, but it does kind of make sense. Um, you have a big tube of water and you take a pump and you push water out that way, what's going to happen at the other end? It's going to pull and it can actually go in. If it goes into suction and there's a leak there, then it's a really easy way for pathogens to get inside your pipe. So the risks of leaks are property damage. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're wasting water, you're wasting money because it costs you money to produce that water. But you also are running the risk of a real safety hazard of having intrusion uh, contaminants coming back inside your pipe. So that's a, another really good reason to make sure you're looking after the leaks effectively. The uh, maintaining chlorine residual throughout your system as well, this is a requirement. Operators will go out and measure the residual chlorine at the end of the system and there's supposed to be a measurable amount out there. Uh, if it's not, they'll, they'll make some changes. So that's something the operators are doing on a regular basis. Uh, the role of council decision makers here would be, again, asset management, much like the treatment side, uh, making sure the operators are trained, again, like the treatment side. Same with the projects for capital uh, requests up to upgrades. The water loss reports uh, would be something that would be compiled by staff typically, or a consultant sometimes hired to do this, to look at where your water is going. It's an audit, really, it looks at where the water is going. You're producing X number of gallons of water or liters of water, uh, and you're billing for this, and what's the difference? We're, typically in Ontario, we have between 15 and 30% loss. So leaks are 15 to 30% common. Um, these water loss reports can help you pinpoint that and ideally reduce it over time because you want to be getting that down for a number of reasons that, that make good economic sense. A lot of municipalities will have a leak detection program in place uh, to help you with you know reducing the amount of leakage going on. Uh, often a contractor is hired to do that. Sometimes staff have their own internal equipment to do that. So there's no, uh, I can go, I can, both are very effective. And in addition to that, having a backflow prevention program which I believe the region does, and you do as well. Great. Yeah, I think you mentioned that, Dave. That's right. Really good idea. Very challenging from a political point of view to... Can I ask you a question about that? Sure. So, so we've undertaken a, an effective back to prevention program. Dave, we're 92%? Or I don't think we're quite that high, but we're high. But, but we've, we, you know, we've went in and we've educated. And, yep. and we're going to see later the perils of not having this. At what point can you say, taps off? So you, you know, 10 years and you've said, okay, the, you know, held their heads, educated, this is why. I don't think there's, a, there's any legislated uh, uh, magic number. Uh, I guess that may be up to you as municipality. Um, maybe a, a, like a, a typical graduated <laughs> warning. Say, you know, we've warned you six times now. <laughs> like at some point, you got to draw a line in the yeah, sand and say, I would say, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to go to jail. Yeah, put this in. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, the one thing inter interesting about backflow prevention um, is <laughs> uh, this is not regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Okay, that's why you had to put a bylaw in place. In fact, it would be easy if it was under the Safe Drinking Water Act because then you then you are yeah. you are legally responsible, yeah. but because it's under the, um, it's plumbing. It's considered to be plumbing. It can't come under the Safe Drinking Water Act. It comes under the Municipal Affairs and Housing Ministry. It's, so you had to put a bylaw in place to deal with it. And it's caused a lot of municipalities a lot of problems. Uh, huge problems from the point of view of enforcing it. It's easy to put a bylaw in place. Stratford had one when they had the car wash episode into it. They, they had a bylaw in place, but they couldn't enforce it properly. So it's the enforcement part of it that's really challenging. Um, okay, but you, it's good to have. You two have been talking about the car wash. <laughs> have, you, have you not? Do you, I think we should all have the story about the okay, car wash. Okay, okay. Uh, 2005, Stratford, Ontario. Um, there was um, 
some uh, maintenance activity going on at the car wash in town. It was one of those self-serve car washes. And uh, they accidentally left the valve open that connected them to the missed water supply. So there was a valve they would open to top up their system with tap water, close the valve, and then go about their activities for people washing their cars. Uh, there's no backflow prevention device on that valve. There should have been at that point where the water goes from municipal tap water to the car wash water. There should have been a backflow prevention device on that. They had put a bylaw in place the year before. They did training for everybody. For whatever reason, that you had that business did not get or did not put in a backflow prevention device. Uh, one day when they left that valve open by mistake, it pushed detergent into the mist water supply. And the first people, luckily, were right across the street that noticed it. And um, they called into the town and said, we have pink foaming water coming out of our taps. So obviously something wrong there. So they investigated and, and very quickly managed to shut down the car wash and also very quickly managed to flush the water from the area because it was a fairly isolated area. So, and the good thing about it, Stratford is nothing bad happened, no one got sick. It was a major inconvenience. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's almost a chuckle in a sense because there's a, one of the pictures had a toilet bowl with pink water in it. So, kind of, but, uh, so that, that's the Stratford episode where um, they had a backflow bylaw, but it wasn't being properly enforced. And uh, that's, that's the challenge. The challenge is always going to be to enforce it. First. So, so there is a lesson to be learned in terms of backflow prevention and um, risk and who may or may not be affected if, uh, if that backflow valve isn't in, isn't in place. Right, absolutely. And the more, the more dangerous the chemicals a business are, is using, the more the higher the risk. Right. right. Uh, so it's... Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a good idea to have it in place. Um, the ministry, when they're doing the inspections, they will usually mention it on their inspection reports, even though it's not within their, you know, they can't order you to do it. They can suggest it, but they can't order you because it's not within the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, but it's, it's a good thing. It's the right thing to do. Very challenging. And it's a tough one. And, and to answer your question, when do you say, when do you say it's over? I don't know. The only I, only thing I could think of was maybe helping them with the cost sharing of the, but then you'd have to do it for everybody. I, it's a business expense, right? So I'm not sure what the answer is. Well, but you probably at some point would want to think about saying, listen, we've given you all the chances and, you know. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Councilor Minjima. Sure. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So for, to ask that question a little bit further, take the question a little bit further. Um, if uh, backflow prevention devices are not regulated under the Safe Water Drinking Act, does that mean that council is not li liable for anything that happens as a result of that? Not under the, not under the standard of care, no. Okay, so how, uh, so that seems... There's no legal requirement for you to put a backflow prevention bylaw in place. Uh, there's suggestions that you do it because it's, it's probably the right thing to do, but there's no legal requirement for you to put it. Okay, so I don't think I think I'm not making a connection. Is there still a, a personal? Uh, do we are we still personally liable? Okay, so you're you're affirming. The bylaw. In, in, I mean, you would put a bylaw in place, and even if you put a bylaw in place, you still wouldn't be personally liable uh, if someone, you know, didn't meet the bylaw. You try to enforce it, right? But it does not fall under the Safe Drinking Water Act. They, the ministry would like it to, but it can't fall under the Safe Drinking Water. So technically, you couldn't be responsible under under the standard of care for backflow, but for a lack of a backflow prevention program. So it falls under our ethical responsibilities. Yes, to be absolutely. vigilant. Yeah, that's no, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah, absolutely, uh, um, knowing that it's it's a good thing to do and it's the right thing to do, and it is something that the ministry is identifying as, uh, you know, it's not it's not a matter of being out of compliance. It's just a suggestion, right? So the ministry will identify it as a suggestion, but there's really nothing they can technically do about it because it's, you know, it's within your jurisdiction. It's within your areas to put in the backflow bylaw, and enforcing it uh, is is, again, is always the challenge. And a question of clarification, Madam Mayor. So how does something like that become um, a, a legal responsibility? Who pushes for that? And for the bylaw, or, or for backflow? 
for it to be something that's considered, yeah, for for it to be something that's considered a, a legal responsibility. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty important. I, I agree. Um, I think that they've they've looked at that and they've tried to talk with uh, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and uh, for whatever reason, um, it hasn't become a legal requirement. Um, I don't have the answer for that. So it's, it's something happens. That's when things change. You're probably, and unfortunately, it's absolutely true. Like, look at the mm -hmm. Walkerton tragedy. I mean, that triggered a lot of changes in the, uh, the drinking water uh, industry. Um, let's hope it doesn't happen, but it certainly could. Um, I think there also, I guess the other side of the argument, too, is there are a lot of industries that require their members to have backflow prevention devices. Uh, one example is the undertaker's industry a good thing. Um, they have specific requirements to have backflow. So backflow devices are out there already. Um, and any new construction has to have backflow. So anything new, uh, it's only really the existing businesses that, uh, and sometimes they're small operations with um, very limited resources. And that's probably the ones that are going to be the most likely to be uh, to be saying I can't afford this because it's quite expensive. You have to insulation the equipment in the first place, and then uh, annual inspections and, and checking of the system, which is a thousand bucks. So it's uh, a lot of plumbers are, are doing that locally and um, promoting that within the within the community. I, 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 I you know, again, it's a bylaw, so it's uh, it's up to the municipality to, to uh, enforce it. And uh, <laughs> I don't have any really good answers for you on that. No, it's, thank you. Appreciate it. But that. it's a number of people are probably about what forty percent of municipalities in Ontario now have backflow bylaws, and um, some have really struggled with it. Honestly, it's 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 been a struggle for some, um, and some have actually removed the bylaw. They had one in place and then they, they pulled it out because it was just not working for them. So I know it's uh, pushback, political pushback from from. Um, from consumers, from business owners, and saying this just isn't working for us. And they decided because it's optional in a sense, right? It's up to municipality. Municipality can also vote to remove the bylaw. So, mm. but it is it is important. It's a good a good thing to be continuing with, and uh, it's it's never going to be uh, hurting you from the point of view of drinking water safety. And that's you know that's what we're talking about here today is drinking water safety. So. I would, I would always recommend supporting backflow prevention. So that's the role you typically would have in distribution uh, monitoring. We collect and spend a lot of money on sampling and testing. Uh, really good idea to be able to uh, review that data and have that data available um, to uh, um, help you with trending and, and, and help you with uh, making decisions going forward. Uh, part of this is also the alarms. It might alarm an operator that something's going wrong. Um, we have a lot of online analytical equipment these days, and that needs to be calibrated, and that's part of the monitoring program. Um, this equipment needs uh, fairly, you know, fairly significant attention to make sure it's running properly, not to mention the fact that there are regulatory requirements surrounding uh, calibration of this equipment. So that's all part of the monitoring program. The role of council in this, again, would be um, looking at the reports really looking at the information that's coming to you from your monitoring programs. This, the drinking water system report, the summary report, uh, which we typically produced annually. Um, I've got a little asterisk here beside the, ME, uh, the MOE, MECP inspection reports, the ministry's inspection reports. They'll do an inspection of your systems every year and they will produce an um, uh, inspection report that is incredibly detailed and uh, and this is what I said before. If, if someone's not doing something wrong with, or not doing something right within staff, uh, you'll know about it. You'll hear about it. And this is the kind of one of the ways you would hear about it. Uh, they would be letting you know in no uncertain terms that something is not, not good, not right, needs to be addressed. Um, and from the point of view of the ministry, given that they would be the ones that would be charging you if charges were ever to be laid under the standard of care, if they identified something in one of these reports uh, and you chose to ignore it, and something bad happened as a result of the issue they identified, 
I think that would put you in a bad position. I really do. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to fix something right away either. Um, they identify something, you would need to address it and maybe put a plan in place to deal with it as a council, but you wouldn't necessarily need to fix it tomorrow or anything. Um, now, the other side of that argument is having received 100% compliance uh, for your operations, that's a non-issue at this point. So it's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> you don't want to be identifying uh, problems if you can avoid it. Okay, so their, their information is coming to you uh, probably in large quantities. I wouldn't necessarily uh, expect that anybody would be reading every line and every word and every page and every number in these reports. I think probably get away with quite, quite effectively with the high-level summary, the executive summary of these reports. Uh, with the expectation that staff would make sure and probably give you a presentation on, on any issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, so um, again, there's a lot of information there and uh, high level summary of these would be fine. The ministry re inspection reports would highlight in, in very clearly uh, if there's anything that, that they think needs attention. So that would be uh, good to look at. The uh, management barrier is um, has got a few more components to it. And again, this is really um, where uh, decision makers certainly fit in here. We have this requirement I mentioned earlier to meet the drinking water quality management standard. You will develop a quality management system to meet this standard. And this is a requirement of all municipal residential systems. Uh, you have to have an operational plan uh, and you need to comply with the requirements as set out by the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act. And emergency preparedness also fits in this one as well, in the management. Um, but I did mention this DDO QMS. Do you have um, a specific person assigned to this, uh, Dave, within the municipality? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, yeah. so so you have a, a usually there's an individual because it's, it's 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 a lot of work to look after this. Uh, you'll have an individual looking after this. They'll be reporting uh, on a regular basis, probably uh, through through Dave. Um, and this quality management system, again, it's sort of like an ISO, uh, ISO uh, management, uh, QMS. Um, it really talks about looking at risks and identifying and managing risks that are facing you. That's you know, one of the most important things. Um, it also asks that you uh, establish procedures and follow those procedures and have them documented, typically standard operating procedures. It also outlines who's doing what, which is critically important in, the, in a situation if there's ever an emergency. You really need to have a good up-to-date list of who's responsible for doing what. And um, also, you need to make a commitment to continually improving this QMS. These things are, are dynamic. They're not static. They need to be continually updated and improved. And um, well, a good example of this is if you're, if you're identifying roles and responsibilities and contact information for people in emergency situations, well, those numbers change. People retire. Uh, good, really good reason why this needs to be continually updated, continually improved uh, in order that you have current information in there. So, and this is a fairly onerous uh, uh, job, but it actually makes sense because it it's, it's can be quite effective. Um, as I mentioned, uh, under the, uh, um, the QMS you've got, uh, you have an operational plan. That operational plan is going to include information about the system and some of the procedures you might be following for uh, infrastructure reviews, as an example, uh, for how you share your and test your uh, and you should share your uh, testing results, and this would typically be posted online uh, for the consumers to see, which I believe you have these posted on the summary reports, so all the water quality data uh, for anybody to look at, uh, and also uh, management reviews are also part of this um, operational plan. And again, I mentioned emergency situations and making sure that you're continually improving this operational plan part of the bigger picture. So the role of the decision maker in the management is to review the audit report. So these, these QMS uh, um, activities that you've developed uh, will be audited internally and externally. Usually, well, it depends on the, on the frequency. It could be three years, it could be two years, it could be annually, depending. Uh, but they will produce an audit report. Uh, so it's going to look at what uh, has been going on with the QMS and uh, identifies any, any areas of non-compliance and non-conformance, mostly non-conformance really with the, with the conforming with the QMS. And those audit reports might be something to look at as well. One word I should mention too about back to the, um, ME, uh, the MOE inspection reports. Um, 
And I mentioned that you have received 100% compliance on your inspection reports from the ministry, which is absolutely fantastic. And I want to point out the level of detail we're talking about here when these people are doing these inspections. Um, if an operator filled in his logbook, so his daily log sheet of operations, if he filled in his logbook in pencil instead of pen, that would be a non-compliance. He would get written up for that. You would hear about it because you wouldn't get your 100% compliance because he has done something that is not... That's the kind of level of detail they're looking at. So it's very rigorous, very, very thorough, uh, which I think, again, going back to 100% compliance is absolutely fantastic. Other things you might be looking at is reviewing that operational plan and making sure you're communicating or you have good lines of communication going with your operating authority. The, um, again, looking at the history of waterborne disease outbreaks, there are so many situations where Complacency, as I mentioned earlier, comes into play, but also communication issues. People aren't talking, they aren't getting along, they're not meeting regularly, they're not, uh, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So these communication lines need to be really, really effective. They need to be working. And again, it's, it's easy with you folks in a sense because it's your staff that's going to be communicating with you as the operating authority. So uh, it's, uh, that's making sure that this is happening as part of your role. Staying informed is another, uh, again, this is more the moral or the ethical side of things. Um, go for a tour. The operators would love to have to show, uh, to show you what they do. Now, a little different in your situation being distribution only, but uh, there might be some, uh, some special interest areas within your, uh, your, your um, municipality where a tour might be appropriate. Uh, always a good idea to get involved in the upgrade of the systems. We've got a couple of folks here that seem to know quite a bit about water, so um, get involved in, in, uh, in the upgrades and in the, in the, in the uh, infrastructure that might be being planned. Look at the drinking water reports. Again, a high-level summary would be fine. Uh, make sure you're aware of the risks. Again, risks are, are, if any, there might not be any significant risks, but if there are any, uh, one of the risks that uh, really is part of the picture nowadays is cybersecurity. And you mentioned earlier about having to change your password and trying to get all through these security hurdles. Um, there are, there are, are un unfortunately, a bunch of people out there that are trying to do uh, nasty things to us all. And it's, it's happening all the time. And uh, uh, actually, there were over 2,300 cyber attacks on municipalities in North America in 2021. 2,300. So it's, it's out there, it's happening all the time. Again, look at the audit reports, the inspection reports, I mentioned that already, and just be familiar with uh, emergency planning uh, and however you do your emergency planning response. Um, some people do a mock disaster to sort of test out their emergency response, maybe a bit overkill, but the tabletop exercises probably isn't a bad idea. So uh, this is the, we'll have, just finish this off with a couple of questions and we'll have a, a bio break if that's, if that's okay with you, Mayor. And um, so first of all, I want to match the activity with the barrier here. So here's the, the activity is using sand filtration to remove contaminants. What barrier does that fit into, filtration? B. B, sure, absolutely. Treatment, makes sense. What about reviewing the operational plan? Which barrier do you think that would be? Sorry. Reviewing the operational plan. E. E. Yeah, that would be management. That was in the management barrier. So just if you have the an answer, if you just put on your microphone so everybody can hear. That's all. Okay. So yeah, the first one is B, as the slide shows. Uh, the operational plan update was E, effective management, uh, identifying risks to your surface water supply. So risks to your surface water supply would be? A. A, absolutely. Source water protection. Uh, the next one is uh, reviewing our sample test results to ensure drinking water safety. So this is reviewing test results. D. D. Exactly. And finally, uh, sampling uh, for chlorine at a fire hydrant. Fire hydrant is the key there. Sorry? 
well, it must be C. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No trick questions here. <laughs> yeah, so that's just a, a bit of a, another way to look at it. Um, so the next question is, what are the components of the multi-barrier approach? I mentioned those five different barriers. Which ones? There's two in here that don't fit. Um, D and F, reporting and emergency management. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They don't. Uh, they don't directly fit in the multi-barrier approach. Based on what we described. Uh, historically, disease outbreaks have occurred when how many barriers failed? Multi-barrier approach. Two. Two or more. Yeah, two or more. Uh, see, see, the right answer there. Two or more barriers. Um, one barrier fails, you might get, hopefully the other barriers are tough enough. Two barriers fail, you might get lucky and not have a disaster. But when you, when you look at the history of disease outbreaks, it's when two or more of these barriers fail that we have a problem. Okay. Uh, would, how much of a, how, how long would you like the break to be? Uh, how long, however long you would like it to be. Five minutes? Okay. Is five minutes ten, good? Five, okay. Yeah. Come back in five minutes. I can't see what time it is. I guess 20. Come back at 20 to 6. Okay. Good. Thanks.
exactly. One of the things they did say at the public inquiry, one of the operators, one of the guys, I can't remember which one it was, because there was the two of them, the brothers, right? The general manager and the operator. Right. Okay, we're going on now. Oh, okay. We're live. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we'll uh, move forward with uh, the third module here, talking about um, what you can do to make sure you stay vigilant over your water system. And we're going to talk a little bit about risks and hazards and the role of council in... Uh, and looking at these, uh, managing these risks, as well as asset management, financial <coughs> planning, which are also requirements of uh, decision makers, and then looking at a few strategies for uh, exercising vigilance over our drinking water systems. Start off with um, risk assessment, talk a little bit about it really quickly, uh, talk a bit about asset management planning and the requirement for it, as well as sustainable, sustainable financial planning, ideally sustainable. Uh, talk a bit more about water audits, we've touched on them a bit already, but. Um, move into communication uh, and emergency planning and then finally conservation. So there's a lot a lot in this module um, to discuss, uh, starting off with risk assessment uh, and what truly risk is. And just to point out that risk is a combination of two things, it's a combination of the degree of hazard of something in the first place, coupled with the probability of actually happening or the likelihood of it happening. And I always like to use the Ebola virus in this example um, because Ebola virus gets everyone's attention, uh, it kills 80% of the people it comes in contact with, but in the context of our drinking water supplies, it doesn't survive very well in water. It uh, typically um, uh, is, is not going to uh, occur in this part of the world, and uh, that means that the risk of Ebola virus is relatively low in our drinking water system, for mainly because it's not likely to occur. So that would actually put it, in comparison to a, a water main break, which um, could be very high level of hazard, uh, and it's much more likely to occur because these things happen all the time. Uh, so the risk of a water main break would be much higher than the risk from Ebola virus outbreak in our drinking water system, just, just a way to put it in perspective. So the risk is always that combination of those two things. Uh, the risk assessment tool actually helps you determine uh, what levels of risk might be associated with different uh, different hazards. And this would sort of be assigning a level of high, medium, or low risk, and a higher, a high, high, medium, and low hazard, and a high, medium, or low likelihood or probability of occurring. And obviously, you'd focus on the things that are uh, the highest um, level of risk. Uh, this can help you with determining priorities for uh, perhaps resource allocation to help you uh, eliminate hazards. Uh, it might help you determine maybe the consequences of some of these hazardous events, uh, developing response measures possibly, and um, emergency response plans too, for that matter. Uh, your emergency response might be a little different for a higher level of risk than it would be for a lower level of risk. And certainly uh, risks to source water. This is a, a requirement of your uh, source water protection plans is to make sure you've got, um, you're looking at risks to your source water, <coughs> assessing the risks to your source water. Some of the hazards we're talking about that could affect our drinking water. The first one is biological, and this is by far and away the most significant threat to our drinking water systems. Um, the things that can make us sick, bacterial, viral, parasitic, protozoan organisms, uh, these are pathogens, human pathogens that can make us sick. And uh, again, this can affect a significant number of people in a very short amount of time. In fact, to be quite frank, it can kill people very quickly. We have a lot of standards we have to meet for different chemical parameters, um, disinfection byproducts, pesticides, there are all kinds of other parameters that we have to meet standards for. Uh, and there's a couple that are particularly nasty for uh, lead, for example, for children. Um, and I don't want to dismiss these as being not as important, but quite honestly, they, rep they rep represent less of, a th less of a threat than our pathogenic organisms. Primarily because in most cases for these different chemicals, they're based on consumption of a liter and a half of water a day for 70 years. Uh, and that's how things are done in Canada. Uh, so they, they say, oh, you're, you're, you have a slight increased cancer risk if you drink this water, a liter and a half of this water a day for 70 years. Um, which is obviously a concern. And we have standards we have to meet uh, for these, these chemical contaminants. But in comparison to a pathogen that could, again, affect large numbers of people in a very short amount of time, there, there is no comparison. Pathogens are by far and away our greatest threat. And that's why we use chlorine. One reason why we use chlorine. There's also physical hazards that are really more of an 
indirect hazard in the sense that the real threat from them is uh, shielding pathogens from disinfectants. So there are particles that uh, disinfect that uh, bacteria can attach to, and, uh, sh and therefore be shielded from ultraviolet light. In some cases, from chlorine. Uh, so it's more of a more of an indirect effect. And then in some cases, we have these radiological hazards that are um, a little bit less frequent, but certainly a factor around any of the nuclear facilities and naturally occurring in some, gra some uh, uh, groundwater sources um, throughout the province. Not terribly common, but they can be out there. So uh, uh, talk a little bit about asset management. This is just a quick chart to show the difference between smart asset management planning and not so smart asset management planning, and this really is just an example. If you look at the red, can you see the red okay? Yeah, if you look at the red line showing you uh, timely investments of $10 million to uh, upgrade the system, I guess this is totally theoretical, uh, but you're making timely investments to maintain the, that asset in good working order, as opposed to running it into the ground and replacing it every, you know, 30 years in this case. And the interesting thing is, um, it's, it's more cost effective to make those timely investments, number one, but from a safety point of view, it's much safer to do it to, to operate that way because if you run the equipment into the ground, then as you get towards the end of that life cycle at the 30 year point, you're running the risk of catastrophic failure of that equipment and that could really lead to safety, uh, to safety concerns. So it's not only more cost effective, it's also safer to look at timely investments in the uh, upgrading uh, your, your, your equipment. Uh, there are uh, requirements under regulation uh, in Ontario, and this again, this is more recent, this 2017, this came into play. Um, I'm not sure what the enforce date was, so I'm not sure if you were dealing with this last time, last time around we did this training. Uh, but this asset management planning is required, and it has to line up your financial plans. It's gonna, there's gonna be a cost associated with, so it makes sense that it'd be lined up your financial plans. And what we're talking about really here is virtually anything that would be involved in the operation of your system, including the trucks, the reservoirs, any buildings that might be associated with it, the fences around it, all that equipment that would be part of the system would be considered an asset. And again, pipes buried in the ground can, and valves and, and all the different components, they can be very significant cost. Um, they need to be maintained, improved, and periodically replaced as necessary requirement under that um, under that regulation. This is an interesting activity that is designed to uh, probably do something you're already familiar with to a large extent, but this is a, a theoretical uh, capital budget um, list of items that need to be approved or not. Um, and it's just a, 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 an example of what you might be facing as a municipality. And again, you've probably seen this and been through this many times before, but it's just a quick look through it. Um, again, we'll look at the, the chart here, which is um, the projects that are being put forth uh, to be considered for funding. One of them is water tower. Inside walls of the water tower are starting to corrode. They need to be recoded so we don't uh, run the risk of contaminating the water. Uh, and you put it off for the last four years because it's going to cost half a million dollars. So, um, you know, what do you do there? The next one is the security around the uh, fence around the, um, the water tower uh, needs to be replaced and probably upgraded with video surveillance to deter the vandals. Uh, the city trucks uh, need to be replaced based on the uh, fact that the repair costs are costing more than the trucks themselves. I'm not sure how many trucks you can buy these days for $100,000, maybe one and a half if you're lucky. Uh, but um, that's an example. Um, chlorination equipment needs recalibration every two months. That's a suggestion there that something's not working properly with that equipment, and that's a bit of a concern. That's why it's listed as a, a number one priority. Uh, the fire chief uh, wants the fire hydrants repainted. So that's not as high a priority. Although I had an interesting comment the last time we did this session, and someone said, I think it was an MOE inspector, looked at the fire hydrants. The fire hydrants are all beautifully painted and it really they looked really good and he said that to me is a signal that what's underground is also in really good shape as well just because the fire hydrants were all painted so that kind of blows my theory <laughs> about, about bringing priority number three here um, but it, and yeah that's one way to look at it I suppose but in reality uh, a little bit of paint chipping off a fire hydrant is probably not as important as a dis disinfection equipment in your system 
Um, again, that's a judgment call, I suppose. Number six, the dis disinfection bulbs are failing every six months. Because you don't have proper surge protection, uh, they should be lasting longer. They should be uh, lasting a year. Uh, so there's another thing to consider. And then the next two, seven and eight, are uh, water main, uh, leaking water mains that um, a lot of breaks that are costing quite a bit of money. And uh, again, there's, there's two sides of that. One of them is they're costing money to replace. The other side of it is you could have an intrusion. So I'm not sure I would put as low a priority on these as two. Uh, I think maybe they should be a bit higher than that, but that's, again, that's, that's an argument to have. Uh, number nine, replace the water meters. Water meters, as they age, they will always under-read. Okay? They're always going to be under-reading as they get older. Uh, so replacing water meters uh, is going to have a payback over time. Um, the other side of it, though, is if you put in new water meters, they're all of a sudden going to be reading accurately and you're going to have people complaining they're using more water even though they're using the same amount. You, then you have to can do a job of convincing them that, no, it's just the meter is now accurate. That's, so that, that's a challenge. could be a bit of backlash there. And then the last one is topping up your filter meter. You're not operating filtering equipment yourselves, but if you were... That would be. It's interesting. There, the, the priorities are mapped out here for you as well, which is probably one of the more difficult things to do. Uh, but the suggestion here is, okay, well, let's go ahead with the items that are number one. Okay, we'll do the number one priorities, and there's more than half your budget right there. Then the challenge becomes, what do we spend the rest of the money on? Again, this is lots of different ways to look at this. Um, this would be a matter of you know determining. Uh, in some cases, for instance, with um, UV disinfection bulbs, there's going to be a payback. So you might dip into reserves to, to pay for some of these things, uh, given that they, you know that there's going to be a payback in two or three or five or seven years. So then again, this is just a theoretical exercise. UV bulbs, th theoretically a five-year payback. So you might want to do that. Uh, the pipe replacement, there's four and seven-year payback based on the estimates there. Uh, and then you're going to get into you've already exhausted your budget. So. You have to really, and again, you, you've been through this, I'm sure you know this much better even than I do by a long shot, so just different types of examples of the things you might be facing. Uh, also replacing water meters at a cost of half a million dollars, um, that would pay back in the long run, um, but again, it's not without its potential backlash from consumers. So just an example of the kind of uh, decisions you might be looking at making which leads us into the financial planning. And ideally, your financial plan should be sustainable. The water rate should be funding the water system. Um, and it, councils are obviously responsible for approving these. Now, when you're putting these financial plans together, uh, it's always a good idea, if you can, to the extent possible, to engage the public. It can be really challenging, but often uh, uh, you might get some really good input from the public. Um, not sure if that's something you typically would do, but it's something to consider. There are also possibilities of um, teaming up with other uh, operations within the economies of scale, really realized by, by putting it together with wastewater operations, which are probably not operated by you anyway, right? If that's regional wastewater? Okay. Uh, we do all the collection. Collection, okay. Yeah. Okay. So there, there could well, well be economies of scale, really, if you're not already doing that. Uh, and also, too, important to consider uh, having... Um, a multidisciplinary team looking at uh, these, these activities, including operations for sure, including the engineering people as well as the accounting people. And the more, the more different people you have with input into this, provided they're, they're working effectively together, uh, the better plan you'll end up with at the end of the day. There's no legal requirement for you to have, uh, I don't think there's a legal requirement for you to have public engagement. It's a good idea. but. Uh, these are just suggestions and key ideas, key principles. Water audits, we've talked a little bit about this already. This is where um, you want to make sure that you're keeping that water safe because of uh, you can get water coming back inside the pipe if you uh, have these pressure transients, pressure fluctuations. And they, they do happen all the time. You would never know if you're not measuring them, so they're, they're going on on a regular basis. Um, not necessarily going into suction all the time on a regular basis, but fluctuation in pressure. It's always happening. Oh, just opening one tap in the system is going to cause a slight change in pressure. So. But these water audits can actually be really useful from the point of view of saving money and uh, 
again, you're, you're, you're spending a lot of money producing water. If it's going to waste, uh, then uh, obviously that's, that's a loss. Um, not to mention the fact you could have significant uh, damage to uh, public and private property. So these water audits can really be, and it might not be a bad idea to look at benchmarks and say, where do we fit in? And if you have you know, 10 or 15% water loss and you're doing really well, sometimes it's going to be impossible to get them all. You probably will realistically not be able to get all the water leaks um, in your systems. But the better, uh, the better job you can do in, in reducing them, the better off you're going to be. Cyber attacks. This is um, one of the areas that has been more and more of an issue uh, for a lot of municipalities. And one thing I forgot to do was to check if the sound worked on this because I do have a short video here. Do you know if the sound is working? It's been a rough two weeks for the town of Midland. Uh, I'm sorry, our system is currently down at home. Ever since hackers took over these computers and demanded a ransom. Melbourne likes to be held hostage and it's just said, how dare you do this to our town? But then you go into recovery mode, and that's what you do. First of all, assess what the damage is and what you need to recover. The damage, most everything has to be processed by hand. So that'll get you the penitentiary. To renew your bus pass or get a marriage license, you're sent to a nearby town. And you can't pay your taxes. The town can't process them. Kind of leaves us hanging with our bills and keeping track of our finances and stuff like that. This arrangement looks great, too. An inconvenience, too, for this event planner, Zalel and his business with the city is accompanied by a sinking feeling. To be honest with you, fear. Like how a little town like us can be hacked. You know, what, what, what's next? The irony is at the time of the attack, the town was almost done upgrading its system to make it more secure. And it had taken out insurance against ransomware attacks after what happened to another small Ontario town. Nearby Wasaga Beach negotiated their hackers down this spring, but eventually had to pay $34,000 in untraceable Bitcoin. It's a growing problem with many municipalities prime targets, especially as some move towards smart technology and the security vulnerabilities that come with that. They often don't have any full-time security staff, and so they're making decisions often that may be slightly out of date because it's very difficult to keep up with the latest in security. As for Midland, its system is almost back up and running. The town paid the ransom. It won't say how much, but it's covered by insurance. The mayor has a warning for others. You can't stop them all, no matter how well-intentioned you are. Best to be ready for when the hackers strike. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Midland, Ontario. And as I mentioned, there, there were over 2,300 attacks in 2021 in North America. <coughs> so. Um, Another thing I want to talk about quickly here is talking about communications. And um, it is really important to have a good communication strategy. Typically, the mayor would be the spokesperson, but that's, that depends on uh, who's designated. Um, but typically, there would be a communication procedure available to, to everybody just to know. Quite often, as a councillor, you might get approached by someone on the street, and uh, I'm not sure what kind of policies you have internally, but sometimes that's... Uh, you know, things should be deferred to the to the mayor or the spokesperson. So, um, the emergency preparedness is also another uh, important component here. We talk about risk assessments, uh, the inspection reports, the source protection plans, the audits. These are all areas that could be potential risks for you. One of the things I feel strongly about, and again, this comes from my work on uh, looking for disasters that have occurred around the world, is um, records of past emergencies. What's happened in the past? We, we need to look back to see what's happened in the past to learn from those experiences. Uh, so something I talk with operators about all the time is learn from those past mistakes because uh, there's no really good excuse for letting them happen again. Uh, one of the case studies that I would put in here if we had more time is North Havelock, New Zealand, where in 2016 they had had uh, bacteriological outbreaks of small outbreaks of disease and, and, and positive samples for bacteria uh, 10 times over a period of nine years, and they didn't do anything about it. Uh, so is, like that to me is, like, you, you've got to react. You can't just let that happen. Um, again, uh, having an emergency response plan, and you want to have this plan in place before you run into an emergency. You don't want to be trying to develop a plan in the middle of an emergency. And you know, we'd all like to think that it's never going to happen, but hey, it could, and it does. 
Uh, if you are in the middle of an emergency, it's really important to get the public on side or try to keep them on side, even if you don't have all the answers, even if you don't know what is really going on, tell them, say, look, we're trying to get to the bottom of it, we're doing this, this, and this. We really don't know what's going on yet, but you're better to say that than you are to be silent. Especially these days with social media, it's so fast, it gets around so quickly, uh, and, and if you stay silent, you're guilty. It just, just seems to be the way it is, unfortunately. Uh, so tell, level with them, talk to them, be co communicating with people about what's going on. Uh, one of the um, things that's not in your books, because this is fairly recent, I've only been recently made aware of this, and I'm going to get uh, Dave a copy of this. This is produced by the American Waterworks Association. The only caveat here is it is for U.S. municipalities. For all intents and purposes, U.S. and Canadian municipalities are, are the same, with the exception of some regulatory differences. The principles are all the same. This is an absolutely fantastic document on risk communication, on things to tell your tell your consumers, including a whole series of short one-page, half-page um, little uh, things that you can say to your consumers when they ask questions about very topical things like PFAS and um, uh, cyanotoxins, uh, blue-green algae toxins. Those are the kind of things that people might be asking questions about. It's got a little primer for you. To, it's a great resource. I'm going to get Dave a copy. I'd suggest that everybody have a look at it. I was... One of those things that I thought, this is absolutely, you read through something and it just really astounded me how good, how well done this is. So that's another resource. Another topic is conservation here. Um, there are a lot of reasons why conservation is good. It's sort of, a, it's a little bit trendy in a sense too from an environmental perspective. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, this is what your constituents are going to want, typically. Uh, but it can help you lower your infrastructure costs over the long term. And it's estimated that for every one liter per day in capacity you need to add to your system, it's going to cost you about $4 in infrastructure costs. So sometimes you can avoid uh, expansion by through conservation practices. The only downside about conservation is you've got to be a little bit careful. Um, we've had some situations where municipalities have put in water meters. They've gone from flat rate to water meters. Uh, and they've implemented a big conservation plan. And it worked. It worked extremely well. It worked so well that the revenues dropped so significantly that they had to react to that. So it's, there's, there's two sides to it. And, uh, you know, you want it to work well, but you got to be careful. So. But that one, uh, one liter per day capacity increase, $4 in expansion costs, you can scale that up to however many. So you can see that there's a lot of dollars that could be saved by a good conservation plan. Uh, so quickly to review module three, what are the hazards that affect the drinking water? Remember we talked about different hazards. Uh, which one doesn't fit? And the, there is a short test at the end if anybody wants a certificate. And uh, it is open book. The test is open book. So, Sorry? B. B, absolutely. It's, uh, it, it's, it doesn't fit. Financial wasn't a hazard. It was physical, biological, chemical, radiological, so financial is the one that doesn't fit. Uh, no, uh, number, um, yes, the next question is, why is asset management so important to municipalities? Why? Just reminding council to, if you're going to answer any questions, to please turn on your microphone. Thank you. So why is asset management so important? Uh, B, because it's more cost effective in the long term and reduce, reduces risks over time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. D is also sort of correct, but it doesn't answer the question of why. So, so B is the right answer there for sure. Remember that chart there with we, you're running into the ground and it could end up in catastrophic failure. So we're coming down the home stretch. This is module four. We're gonna talk a little bit about some case studies, things that actually did happen. Um, in some cases, tragic outcomes, uh, as we saw with uh, many of these other case studies. Again, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time reviewing disasters around the world and quite often there are deaths involved and uh, uh, it is really tragic, especially in light of the fact that 
almost every case, they were easily preventable in hindsight, right? So. Flint um, was uh, probably one of the biggest letdowns of, uh, in my mind, of um, the regulator, regulatory agencies in, in the water industry I've ever seen anywhere in the world. And this was really not, it did fi in fact, a lot of times people point fingers at the elected officials in Flint, and it wasn't the elected officials at all, it was these emergency managers who were appointed by the state who were trying to save money. So I'll show you the quick video here first, and I think this might be a bit louder. The images of the water are shocking enough. Would you drink that? People have dumped in this river forever. It's like we're in the cesspool. My tub, you should see it, is brown. And then come the headlines. An American city failed to provide basic protections to its citizens, and now the children of Flint have much higher than normal levels of lead in their blood. Rick Snyder, governor of Michigan, has apologized. I'm sorry, and I will fix it. President Obama declared a national emergency. You can't shortchange basic services that we provide to our people. And now 2016 presidential candidates are starting to weigh in. The governor of that state acted as though he didn't really care. Lead poisoning is terrible and terrifying. No amount of exposure is safe. And there's evidence that years after we got it out of paint, gas, and more, it contributed to a drastic drop in crime in the 90s. The city has switched back to cleaner water, but the effects will last decades. We take clean water for granted. How could this possibly happen in 2016? Well, you've got to rewind to 2011. Flint was broke. It had lost about half its population after the car factories closed. It had 1.1 billion in unfunded pension costs. It had to cut half its police force. Michigan had a solution called emergency managers. Now he's been appointed by the governor to turn around Flint's finances, Mike Welcome. These managers can make cost-cutting measures without the normal political procedure. I think what we have to do is look at the expense side first. There could be services that we can no longer provide in the city. And they decided the city could save money on water. Flint would stop buying water from Detroit and join a new regional water system. And as a temporary measure, Flint would use water from the Flint River. The switch happened in 2014. Here's the Flint. Flint. And who decided to do this exactly is under intense debate. But regardless of blame, the story gets worse. Residents saw and tasted the dirty water and started complaining. Water's brown, um, has a bad odor. I'm afraid to even um, feed it to my cat or my dogs. We should not have to pay for the water. It's nasty. But the city claimed federal tests showed the water was safe. An employee at the Environmental Protection Agency leaked a Michigan report to a local activist which showed the water had higher than normal lead levels. The city's response? Flint told the woman the lead came from her plumbing. It took an outside investigation by Virginia Tech researchers that found elevated lead levels in the water for the state to admit there was a problem in September 2015. So the corrosion's eating up the pipes, it's eating up the iron pipes, it's causing main breaks, it's causing distilled water. In about 20% of the homes, there's just too much lead. In October 2015, the government bought water filters for its citizens and switched back to water from Detroit. Before all this, 2.1% of the city's children had high blood lead levels. After, it was 4%. For kids under five in the most affected zip codes, it was 6.3%. Why did Flint poison its citizenry? Under emergency managers from the state, it wanted to save money. To start to reverse the effects will cost dearly. Just switching back to Detroit's water cost $12 million. A class action lawsuit against the city is pending. And, and it's interesting when you look at a uh, number of people that were charged. Originally, there were 15 people that were charged criminally. Pretty much all were regulatory agency people. The US EPA, the equivalent of Health Canada, the equivalent of the Ministry of Environment, the equivalent of the Ministry of Health, and the equivalent of the local health unit. All of those people within all of those organizations were charged. And why? It's because those people didn't matter. And that's what's sad. So um, as they mentioned in the video, they were buying water from the city of Detroit. That water was already treated. Detroit had lead service lines. So Detroit already had that treated water uh, and uh, treated to a very high standard so it wouldn't leach lead out of the plumbing. When they switched to the Flint River, it was a completely different source. They started up their own water plant that wasn't ready to run. And the water from the Flint River was much more what they call chemically aggressive. So it attacked the pipes, it attacked the lead, uh, and it put the lead into solution. 
I was not the locally elected officials. I think it's important to point that out. Uh, it was the emergency managers uh, that were appointed by the state. So um, it wasn't directly a result of the... I think that that's important, really. Uh, but it was really a matter of water chemistry. And any operator, any good operator in Ontario would look at that and say, that's, a, that's an accident waiting to happen. That's a recipe for disaster. Uh, and in fact, it certainly was. So the plant was put into service before it was ready. The, uh, the superintendent of the plant said that publicly. He stated that. And it's a good thing he did because he was going to be charged as well. But he said that this, this plant should not go into service. Uh, now, in Canada, um, the Municipal Act does not allow municipalities to go bankrupt. In fact, in 1935, uh, Windsor tried to go bankrupt, but they were told they couldn't. They had to amalgamate suburbs all around to uh, annex them so that they could avoid going bankrupt. Uh, so it's not, it's not technically not allowed in Canada. But you know what? There's always going to be financial pressures on councils uh, with, with resource allocations. Always, always going to be financial pressures. So it um, makes it challenging. Uh, the next one is uh, this public trust case study. So this is in your books. This is a, a paragraph here on a, a, a situation that, that uh, it is theoretical, but it's based on some real, some truth here and there. Um, and what we're going to do is read through the case study and then answer some of these questions. So we'll give you a couple minutes to do that. Uh, it's, uh, does everybody have, everybody has the book, the manual? So this is about uh, public trust. Okay, so in this next slide, you don't have this in your books, but I've kind of summarized the case study just to sort of uh, uh, make it a little bit more easy to follow. Uh, so what they had in this particular situation is they had a surface water source, uh, as you would with the Grimsby or, or uh, um, DQ, uh, conventional filtration plant, much like what they would have there. Uh, but instead of using free chlorine for disinfectant, they switched to another form of chlorine, uh, which is called chloramines or chloramination. And it's just a, it's a disinfectant, very similar, slightly different. And the reason that they would switch to it, because it lasts longer, it's more persistent in the distribution system, which is a good thing. It doesn't have the same effect. It doesn't kill as well, though. It's not as powerful a disinfectant, but it lasts longer. So uh, they chose to use this. A lot of the large systems are using this, uh, York Region, Toronto. Um, people that have large distribution systems use this technique. It also helps reduce disinfection byproducts, which is also a good thing. Uh, so they switched to this chloramination, this, these chloramines for disinfectant. Things were going along fine for the most part. And then after about 10 years, they started noticing leaks appearing in the system in the plumbing, uh, in, in, including in the consumer's homes um, and leaks throughout the system. And they weren't quite sure about this. So there was some uh, discrepancy or discussion here that ensued about what was causing these leaks. And some people suggested it was leaks because the plumbing is old, and other people said it's leaks because the chloramines are causing these problems. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, the issue has been brought to, work, brought to council. Well, fortunately, or unfortunately, I guess it's been how you look at it. It's been brought to council, and now all of a sudden it's showing up on social media, and as a council, you're trying to figure out what to do about it. So this, this was a challenge. And again, this is based partly on, on, on truth to, to a large degree because this actually did happen in municipality. Um, I think luckily it was before social media was really, really big. But, um, so the questions we want to answer here, if it's a real issue, is it going to go away, stay the same, or get worse, realistically? 
Councillor? It'll get worse. Absolutely. There's no reason why it wouldn't. It's not going to get better on its own. It's highly unlikely. If it does get worse, some of the implications might be uh, any number of different things. Thank you, Mary Easton. Um, if it's leaking and the pipes are breaking, contamination to the water by the leaks would, could occur and people absolutely. can get sick. Sure, absolutely. Contamination of the water. Um, other things might include property damage. Um, sir? Yeah, and you, you run the risk of a catastrophic failure at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, all, kind of, all, all kinds of things could potentially happen there as a result of, uh, of this problem. Um, but what do you do? What action should you take? What would be a good plan of action, do you think? One of the things that, sorry. I didn't see anyone else putting theirs on, so. <laughs> well, they'd absolutely have to figure out what's causing it. Is it old pipes? Is it the disinfectant that they're using? And they've got to, if it is, they've got to stop it. They've got to fix, the fix it immediately and start repairing it, start looking at their entire system. And how might you go about determining whether it's the... Well, it something we talked about earlier when I was talking about um, reaching out to maybe... Uh, and this is a good example of that because you don't have agreement. Even like in, internally, the mm -hmm. dip, people are saying different possible causes here. So this is where you might want to reach out to that consultant or to another municipality that has been practicing chloramination, as an example, like York or Toronto or somebody there, to give you that guidance to help you with formulating a plan and, and to try and figure out what to say. Uh, then you'd be dealing, figuring out what to tell the public. Again, this is trending on social media, so you don't want to stay quiet. Um, Maybe to talk to the public and say, we're working on a solution to this problem. We realize there's a problem and we're going to stay in contact with you and stay tuned as we're going to update you. Uh, you know, there's any number of different things you could say, and, but I think along the lines of that, because if you choose to stay silent, I think that would probably put you in a bad, you know, potentially in a bad position because it's going to look like you're hiding something, you're covering something up. So just a suggestion there. These kind of issues are can spread like wildfire, as we all know, with social media these days. So that was a public trust case study. Um, the last one, and we're almost done here, this is, uh, this is a little bit alarmist. Um, and I think we should take comfort in knowing that this particular organism we're going to talk about here hasn't been found uh, in any of the northern states. It's only really been found in the deep south. But we do have climate change, and there's other things that are showing up here. In fact, I've had a, an opossum in my backyard at home. I haven't seen an opossum uh, in, my, in, my, uh, in my area in a long time. I live in Bolton, uh, a bit far north for an opossum, but they're coming, and uh, uh, things are changing. The other thing is the toxic algae, the blue-green algae, are showing up farther and farther north in lakes. So I'll just uh, show, play this video quickly. Hopefully it'll... In Texas now, where the governor has issued disaster declarations in one county, after a six-year-old boy died from a deadly grain-eating amoeba found in the water, claims sent out is in Lake Jackson with the story of Henry Clayton. Hey, good morning, George. This is that water splash park that tested positive for that grain-eating amoeba. It is also the place that six-year-old boy came to play a few days before he died. This morning, authorities in Texas are tracking a deadly grain-eating organism that may have arrived in a tainted city water supply, killing a six-year-old boy. I just want my son back. Josiah McIntyre's mother says her son, who loved the Astros, started complaining on September 3rd that he wasn't feeling well. Doctors soon discovered Josiah had a brain-eating amoeba, but in just five short days, he was dead. My baby had a headache and a fever and vomiting, and, you know, as a parent, for, for it to go from something like a headache to a brain-eating amoeba, it's... It's a hard pill to swallow. Just days before he got sick, Josiah played in this splash pad in Lake Jackson. After he died, the city shut it down using a private company to test the water. That test came back negative, but a second, more sensitive test last week, recommended by the CDC, was positive. The amoeba also found in a hose at the boy's home. We have to keep in mind there's really no effective treatment for this. Prevention is very important. Experts say the amoeba, which is rare but almost always fatal, infects the body through the nose. 
it's not about drinking water. It's about avoiding activities where the water goes into the nose, so not diving headfirst into a lake or doing a slip and slide where the water is going back into the nasal passage. Authorities are now working to flush and disinfect the water supply using chlorine, ordering all residents of Lake Jackson to boil the water before using. We're working as hard as possible to, to get the water system back online and make sure that it's safe. State and federal officials also working to find out how the amoeba, which thrives in warmer temperatures, contaminated the water. I'm, you know, heartbroken. The National Guard is now here handing out bottles of water, and officials are warning that flushing and cleaning the entire water system could take another 60 days. Robin? Let's keep that in mind. Clayton, thank you very much. And certainly thank you for yeah, so that's, uh, like I say, it's a little bit alarmist, but, um, you know, things do happen, and it's, uh, um, now, this also reinforces the, a little bit about chlorine, how chlorine will kill these, uh, will kill this brain-eating amoeba, just for what it's worth, so. Um, in a very warm climate like that, the chlorine dissipates quite quickly, and if it's not there to protect, then it, these things can, can grow and can flourish. So that's, um, that's a, well, you know, we're nearing the end here. Um, anybody want to share any thoughts or ideas or suggestions here? I handed out a quick uh, yeah, just a second. feedback form. And Okay, so um, yeah, there. Uh, any thoughts or ideas? Um, Clint, closing on uh, what we talked about today. Scary, yeah, it's it is. Uh, also, a really good reason why we want to make sure we do a good job of. Uh, yeah, thanks, Your Worship, Brian. Wasn't there a um, a recent incident in Saginaw as well? Over the last year or year and a half, I thought there was a toxic algae scare. Is uh, that what it was in, in Lake in Michigan? In Saginaw, Michigan. There was one in Quebec. I was thinking of. Um, there, you know what? There are there are quite a few okay. uh, that don't always make the news. Um, but if you look at, I say I developed a course on this, and it's kind of surprising how many there really are. Uh, and then on top of that, the majority of disease outbreaks go undetected. So they're a lot more frequent than we honestly really think they are. So one of the, one of the reasons for it is the, remember I talked about the um, intrusion, of water back inside the pipe? That is thought to be the cause of a whole bunch of previously undetected outbreaks around the world, in the developed world. Uh, because there are a lot of outbreaks that have happened. They can't really figure out what it is, what caused it, but it's because of intrusion. If you're not measuring it, you're not going to notice it's there. So just in closing then, uh, three things to remember. Be informed, ask questions, get answered, and recognize it is your duty as a, a decision maker over the system. So that's, that's the end of the formal part of the presentation. There are two organizations I've listed here at the bottom of this slide. These are not in your books. And this is the... Uh, Ontario Municipal Water Association, which is a political wing of the water industry, uh, it's the OMWA, and they are a, a tremendous resource for, um, for drinking water, and the Ontario Water Works Association, OWWA, uh, that are also, and, and of course the Walker Dean Clean Water Centre uh, Resource Library. Those are all really good sources of information. In addition to that guidebook that I'm going to get uh, a link to for Dave, and he can uh, circulate that around. So thank you so much, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Okay, and as time goes by, more, more questions, Councilor McClure. Thank you, through you. I wasn't sure if there was time to ask uh, his profession, his opinion. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, so through you too, Brian, thank you, and um,
explore this uh, course and the information you provided, I just wanted to ask you a, a, your opinion on uh, uh, cast iron pipes and their safety. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, there, there's, there's much to say about trying to replace as, m uh, as many of these pipes as possible, some being in some municipalities 100, 150 years mm -hmm. old. Like mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on the safety of uh, cast iron pipes and when do you think the best time to replace them would be? Well, they're, that's a really tough question. Um, I know the town of Petrolia has cast iron pipes in the ground. They've been in the ground for probably over 150 years now. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with cast iron pipes as long as they're not you know, experiencing huge numbers of leaks and breakage. But that's, there's, it depends entirely on the water chemistry both inside the pipe and the soil and water chemistry outside the pipe. And there's no reason why those can't last uh, in almost indefinitely uh, under the perfect conditions. Um, but it would really be a matter of looking at the frequency of water main breaks. And there's leak detection equipment. They use it's acoustic leak detection equipment now, and they can, they can hear leaks in systems. They try to do it in the middle of the night when no one's using water, and they actually listen for water flowing. And if there's no obvious source of usage, then they, they're identifying potential leak, and then they, they can pretty well, pretty closely zero in on it with acoustics technology. It's getting more sophisticated all the time. But I wouldn't say that you'd want to go ahead and replace cast iron pipe just because it's old. Uh, you probably would not want to have some evidence that it's actually leaking because there's absolutely nothing wrong with cast, cast iron pipe or ductile pipe or nothing wrong with that at all, absolutely, unless it's, of course, it's, it's, it's failing. Thank you. And then, uh, if, if I may ask another question, just um, with regards to, uh, you know, I, I'm from, I've been around for a while. I, I, I remember drinking water out of a water fountain. Now that we're having all these water filtration systems, what are your thoughts on the effectiveness and the need or necessity of water filtration systems when we're held to such a high standard of delivering quality water? You mean home type treatment devices? Home or at, at a municipal uh, facility. Well, filtration from the point of view of large municipal filtration plants? Uh, no. Like, okay, uh, beyond that, you mean a secondary sort of? Secondary. Yeah. Uh, um, um, I've got bottle, bottle refill stations type thing. Uh, if people want to drink water that's been filtered uh, or bottled water, I mean, you can't, you can't argue with that. It's one thing to recognize with bottled water there are absolutely no government regulations on bottled water whatsoever. No, there's zero. And we have incredible regulations and requirements for our tap water, but absolutely zero regulations on bottled water. Now, it's not in the best interest of the, bottle, the bottler to poison its consumers, its people, but there's zero regulations. There's nothing they have to conform to in terms of, top, in terms of bottled water. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing, too, is you have to be really careful with some of these treatment devices because uh, there was a family in Ohio that had one of those um, uh, activated carbon-type filters, not unlike what you would find in a Brita, that type of a filter. I don't know that it was Brita, but it was that type of a filter. And if you keep those at room temperature and you don't change them often enough, they become a breeding ground for bacteria themselves. Activated carbon is a great medium for growing bacteria and all they need is a little bit of nutrients keep it at room temperature you have the potential so as a family in Ohio and two of the four family members were killed from pathogenic bacteria that were breeding in their activated carbon filter so just a caveat just a heads up <laughs> if you're going to use a Brita filter change it every month and keep it in the fridge uh, but you know people some people really notice and, and object to the taste and smell of chlorine that's fine, I can understand that, but make sure you're following the procedures of the equipment you're using. Um, from a safety point of view, it's probably not necessary, but who knows, there could be times where it's, you know, generally speaking, it's not, not necessary, not required. Okay. But some people take comfort in it, some, sometimes it's psychological too. If you do the math on, it's interesting, if you do the math on, I was in, in, in a conference in, uh, in Windsor, and I was staying at Casino Windsor, and they had these 375 milliliter bottles of Voss spring water. Okay, this was designer water, so to speak. It was $8 for roughly a third of a liter of water. If you do the math and you know, get your eight glasses of water a day, that's 
But if you go to Walmart and you buy bottled water, that's still $16,000. Whereas your tap water for your eight glasses a day might cost a couple dollars, five dollars maybe max. So it's just to put it in perspective. This day and age when everybody's trying to look at squeezing a dollar to buy bottled water is, um, to me, is, is, you know, it doesn't make sense. But people are, it's, it's a perception. We haven't done a good job in this industry of promoting ourselves. As, as an industry, tap water producers, and so. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor. So <clears throat> the test <laughs> has been circulated, so I guess uh, you want us to fill this in. Um, yeah, so yeah I do we'll need to, our, we'll do need to collect that in order to, in order to get certificates. Uh, it is a requirement of the center to, uh, <laughs> I apologize, but uh, it is a requirement of the center to complete the test. Okay. So. All right, well, um, I'm just going to, uh, I don't see any other questions from any councillors, but I'm going to look to uh, CAO Mike Kirkopoulos. I mean, you've spoken a number of times about the high rating that we've received, and we know we've had some repeated um, performances on that, and we're pretty proud of it, but it is the staff that's doing that work. So, Mike, if you have a few comments to close out this session, that would be great. Absolutely, and thank you, Madam Mayor, for the opportunity. Brian, I want to thank you for the presentation, but uh, I do want to acknowledge, really, Dave uh, and our public works team uh, for the work they do every day. Frank, who's on the line, uh, Vanna, who's not joining us tonight, and Jillian, uh, but all our water operators as well, ensuring the safety of our drinking water, I think, as we heard from, from you, Brian, and we've heard um, every time we do this presentation and every time we hear this is really a shared responsibility and I think you spoke tonight uh, really about that constant vigilance that we take and and I think again from uh, from my perspective uh, today's really an opportunity to support council in your role uh, as oversight uh, bodies uh, that have a responsibility for our drinking water systems. I think one of the things we heard tonight both from a safe drinking water perspective but also a public health perspective is the importance of investing in our infrastructure. And, and I want to thank Council for your support over the last number of years, at least since I've been here, and even before that, for, for taking that investment seriously and for, for being very supportive uh, and having the resources um, that we've required uh, to provide safe drinking water. So those are my comments, uh, Adam Aaron. I wish everyone a good luck with the test. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mr. CEO. Thanks very much, Brian, and uh, we'll finish this up before we leave here tonight. Um, I do have a motion moved by Councillor Russell that Council receive and file as information the workshop presentation regarding the Safe Water Drinking Act. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Uh, thank you. So we'll do a show of hands this evening as uh, we've had some technology issues. So um, all those in favour? And seeing that in the chambers, all hands are raised. And those also on remote, Councillor Russell and Councillor Brunet is in favor. Thank you, that carries. Thank you very much. That motion is carried. <clears throat> we have no um, confidential items this evening, councillors. Um, are there any further committee remarks? There being none, and there being no further business, I call this meeting adjourned at um, 1835. Thank you very much, everyone.